Thank you uh, very much for everyone promptly uh, being here tonight. Uh, today, um, we are beginning our hearing uh, March 18th, just after St. Patty's Day. I saw my rainbow this morning, so something good can happen today. I'm, looking, I'm still looking for that pot of gold. Uh, H. Conrad's 25, establishing the budget for the United States government for fiscal year 2014 and setting forth appropriate budgetary levels for fiscal years 2015 through 2023. Uh, I note that uh, in coming here tonight, we're all trying to get our work done. I know that uh, when Mr. Van Hollen and Mr. Ryan come, it's always a very busy time, uh, and so I will state up front uh, as a request. I, I know from both of you that we want to try and get through this next hour and a half or so before we go to votes with you both as the panel, uh, and I'm delighted that you're here. And uh, my opening remark really is I, I, I welcome you here, and I want to thank Chairman Paul Ryan uh, for a tremendous leadership that I believe you are offering, thank you. Uh, not just to the country, uh, but to future generations who see the things that are needing to be done in Washington, making tough votes, coming up with ideas. Uh, for the third time now, you've produced a budget that will demonstrate what I consider to be a bold vision for restoring our economic vitality and fiscal discipline with pro-growth policies. While the President has failed to lead on these issues, denying the deficits even a problem and spending is a problem, you, I believe, are providing real leadership and talking through action. We've reached a crossroads in this country, and we can continue down a pathway that we're going that will lead us straight to Europe or we can take this head on and tackle the tough issues and tough decisions and lead with a pathway that I believe, once again, you are leading us on today. Uh, I think this path will enable us to once again to be clearer as economic leaders, not just in the world, but that we can follow the same advice we give to others around the world who are having tough economic times path of individual empowerment and harnessing the power of free markets to create prosperity and opportunity. And I believe that that is outlined in the budget. I think we all recognize that this path demands hard choices, decisions that will have to be made. And I don't think anybody thinks this will be easy, but I think it's necessary. I think it's necessary not just for us, the people who are in this room, but also those that are not here our children, and our grandchildren. We've, been, we've benefited in this country because of wise leadership in the past, and wise leadership must always be present for America to have a bright future. I know that many of our friends uh, on the other side of the aisle, including my dear friend Chris Van Hollen, uh, are saying that we're abandoning seniors and veterans and the neediest among us, and I am very concerned about the way we characterize each other's work around here. I think that nothing could be further from the truth. I think I am concerned not just about seniors, my parents, veterans, my dad, and the neediest among us. All I have to do is look to the Down Syndrome community and my commitment to that and other disabled people, and I am worried about them. But this bill will strengthen their future and provide them an opportunity to have uh, a, a better life. So I look forward tonight to not only hearing from Chairman Ryan, but also my, my dear friend Chris Van Hollen, who has come before this committee year after year and argued uh, for the things that he agrees with and his vision of the future, and I'm delighted that you're here. And I'd like, now like to yield to our ranking member, the gentlewoman, Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'll just make a point or two because I feel like we've been debating this bill this whole idea here for a long time it goes back to the Saturday we spent here uh, on Obamacare, talking about what was going to happen with Medicare. Um, I know we're talking, calling this a, a path to prosperity, but I think it may be a path to pain. Um, we've seen this before, as I've said, and a uh, number of things that worry about, mostly the repeal 
of the Affordable Care Act. It turns Medicaid into a block grant program as well as food stamps and turns Medicare into a voucher program. Well, I think it's been totally repudiated by most of Americans. I think something like 76 percent of them would like to have cuts, but they want them done judiciously. So instead of creating jobs, they're going to lose two million more in two years, according to the Economic Policy Institute. And we have created four million new jobs since President Obama has taken office. Um, now, you're going to assume the repeals, I understand it, of the affordable health care, but you're going to keep the, the taxes in there, the money that's raised. Um, and under the majority's new proposal, one of the things that concerns us a lot is millionaires are going to get another tax cut. We seem to bent over backwards and completely out of shape here to make sure that, that the poor and the middle class pay the price so that the, the vast wealthy people the United States won't have to. They get an average tax cut if you're a millionaire or a billionaire of at least 245000 while the average middle class family will get a bill for $3,000 more. So a budget does reflect our values, and we don't believe that this budget will reflect the values of the American people. It certainly doesn't anything to do anything about job crisis or the sequestration. So I would hope that we could uh, consider Mr. Van Hollen's budget as well as some of my other colleagues. The budgets that we want are proposals that will invest in the nation, create jobs, and reduce the deficit in a responsible way while protecting the programs like Medicaid and Medicare for the next generation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I appreciate both you being here without objection. Uh, any written testimony that you have will be uh, entered into the record, and uh, obviously we're delighted that you're here with your uh, presentation, gentlemen from uh, Wisconsin, the chairman of the Budget Committee, Mr. Ryan's recognized. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Slaughter. Uh, good to be back with you again. We've seen we've done this a lot over the years. <laughs> um, this is the uh, seventh budget I've written, uh, hopefully the third one I will have passed. And it does uh, quite different things than I would argue that the ranking member mentioned. Uh, number one, we feel we owe the American people a responsible, balanced budget. Uh, that's what this d delivers. We think it's normal, reasonable, uh, rational, important to actually get government to live within its means. That's why we match spending with income. Um, so for the third straight year, we're going to deliver a budget. And our budget will balance. This one will balance within 10 years. Um, why are we doing this? We don't see balancing the budget as some important accounting exercise or some statistical um, endeavor to get spending and revenues to, to match. We're doing this because we think it's essential to helping improve people's lives, to getting a healthier, stronger economy that creates jobs, to getting government to live with it in its means so that we can give our kids a debt-free future. We're very worried about the level of debt we have today, the trillion-dollar deficits we've been racking up, and what that does to our economy today and what it's going to do to destroy it for the next generation. And so we believe everybody needs to pitch in and, and do something about this. That's why we're offering a balanced budget. Now, I would ask you to fully consider this, the full substitutes that are being offered in front of you. We've had a great tradition in the budget process where if any member wants to bring a full substitute to the, to the floor, they're able to do so. So I hope that we can continue that kind of a tradition. The ranking member is offering a budget. I think the Progressive Caucus, the Black Caucus, um, I think Mr. Mulvaney is bringing one, and uh, the, the Republican Study Committee. So I hope that we can have that kind of a debate like we've had before. Um, I'll, I'll mention um, a couple of the things that the gentlelady mentioned. Uh, she said the path to pain. Actually, the real pain comes from kicking the can down the road. The real pain to Americans, to seniors, to people living on the safety net, is doing nothing and kicking the can down the road and watching a debt crisis engulf this country. Because what happens at a debt crisis the people who get hurt the first and the worst are the poor, the elderly, the people who need government the most. That's what's going on in Europe right now. They're slashing benefits to current retirees after they've retired. What we're saying is let's get ahead of the problem. Let's put in reforms that are phased in so that we don't change or jeopardize the benefits for anybody in or near retirement today, but save these programs from going bankrupt for tomorrow so that my generation and my children's generation can count on these critical programs like Medicare. Another point. We need jobs. We need economic growth. This debt is a threat to that. We propose fundamental tax reform, and yes, 
we say we should actually bring tax rates down by plugging loopholes. Uh, one of the issues that the general lady needs to be corrected on is we do not keep the Obamacare taxes. We call for what we call revenue neutral tax reform. That means take the current amount of revenues coming to the federal government, which do include the fiscal cliff and everything that's happened, which is in what we call the baseline, and replace it with tax reform that will be produced later by the Ways and Means Committee in conformity with this budget. But we don't keep the medical device tax, the provider tax, and all of those things. We think a better tax code can deliver the same amount of revenues while producing more economic growth by making our businesses small and large, more internationally competitive so we can create more jobs and have faster economic growth. I'd also say, um, I know that the pollsters say, use the word vouchers when you describe our Medicare plan because that makes it sound really bad. Um, this isn't a voucher. It's premium support. What is premium support? Premium support is a plan where you get to choose comprehensive guaranteed plans to meet your need and then Medicare subsidizes your premiums. You don't get a voucher like a, 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 a check in the mail. You get a book of guaranteed plans to choose from, including traditional Medicare in our proposal, a bipartisan proposal. And then Medicare sends money to your provider to subsidize your premiums. More for the poor and the sick, less for the wealthy. Premium support is how the Part D benefit works today. Premium support is how the federal employee plan works today. Premium support is an idea that came from Democrats in the first place. It's the only bipartisan solution on how best to save and strengthen Medicare because if we don't do something to save and strengthen Medicare, it will go bankrupt. It's an important program that we've got to make sure that we can secure. And so what we do is we get spending in line with revenues, we balance the budget so that we can pay off the debt. And we put incredibly important pro-growth policies in place. Open up our natural resources so we can be energy independent, so we can bring down gas prices, home heating prices, stretch people's paychecks further, create more jobs, get spending under control, honor our first commitment to the, uh, that the Constitution has, our national security. On and on is what we propose, basically. Fund defense, grow jobs, pay the bills, save Medicare, and give the states more flexibility to tailor their poverty-fighting programs to actually fight poverty. The last point I'll make is this. We should stop measuring our efforts, whether it's fighting poverty or whatnot, by how much money we throw at the problem. We should measure our efforts as to whether they're succeeding, whether they're helping people or not. We have been fighting the war on poverty for over a generation. We spend a trillion dollars at all levels of government on fighting poverty, and we have 46 million people in poverty, the highest rate in a generation. Let's rethink this. Let's look at what are better ways of tackling this problem. And I would strongly argue that the principles that were used in welfare reform in the late 1990s, which dramatically lowered child poverty rates, which helped get single moms back into lives of self-sufficiency and upward mobility, are the kinds of principles that we're employing here to have another war on poverty, but an effective one. So we're taking the lessons we use from welfare reform, reapplying them in the other parts of our safety net that aren't working, so that we can get social mobility reignited. A growing economy, getting people the tools they need so they can get the lives they want, and making sure we can get government to live within its means and give our kids a debt-free country. That's what we're trying to achieve with this. The, the stark contrast to this approach is all of these other substitutes. I would argue that the, the, the proposal here that has the smallest tax increase and the smallest spending increase is the Senate Democratic budget. All the other proposals before you, whether it's the Van Hollen substitute, the Congressional Black Caucus substitute, the Progressive Caucus, obviously not the RSC budget, budget, all of those offered by the other side of the aisle have one thing in common, massive tax increases on top of the $1.6 trillion in tax increases that have already taken into law, and even higher spending than if we did nothing at all. So we're not looking at budgets that are actually reducing spending. There are net spending increases above where we are right now. That, to me, is, is, is a kicking the can down the road path. That, to me, is raising taxes on job creators, slowing down the economy just to fuel more spending in Washington, which means we'll, have a, we'll, we'll go faster toward a debt crisis. And so I, I look forward to the opportunity to debate these on the floor, and um, I'll yield uh, to any questions you might have after Ms., Mr. Van Hollen's comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ryan. Mr. Van Hollen? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Slaughter, uh, members of the committee. Let me just uh, pick up on the last uh, point where uh, Chairman Ryan left off. Um, he calls it a massive uh, tax increase. The reality is that the budget we've put forward as House Democrats has less revenue embedded in it than the bipartisan Simpson-Bowles Fiscal Commission proposal did. Point two, if you look at the ratio 
of cuts to revenue in our democratic alternative compared to the totality of the Simpson Bowles Fiscal Commission, uh, we have a higher ratio of cuts to revenue. Uh, now, I hear some members asking, why is that a good yardstick? Because that is the result of a bipartisan commission of Republicans and Democrats trying to get together to hammer this out, uh, as opposed to what we think is a one-sided, lopsided uh, proposal uh, that balances the budget on the backs of important investments uh, in our kids', kids education, which is absolutely necessary for our international competitiveness, uh, by making deep cuts in our investment in our infrastructure and transportation, which is also necessary to help power our economy, deep cuts in science and research, uh, as well as we believe, and I'll amplify on that, what we believe is violating uh, our commitments to our seniors. But let me focus first on what our budget focuses on, which is not just economic growth and jobs in the future, but jobs and economic growth now and in the future. Uh, because if you look at the Congressional Budget Office analysis, what it shows is that half of our deficit this year, in fiscal year 2013, half of that is due to the fact that we have unemployment, uh, that our economy is not at its full potential. And they project that three quarters of our deficit in the year 2014 will be is because of people not all back to work. So that's what we focus on immediately, getting the economy growing, getting people back to work, strengthening the middle class. So we do that in two ways. Number one, we replace the sequester. Uh, we replace the sequester in a way that has targeted, balanced cuts, cuts to programs and spending, but also cuts to tax expenditures and tax breaks for very wealthy people. And we time those cuts in a way that doesn't hurt the economic recovery right now. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office has said that if we don't replace that sequester uh, in a smart way, we'll see 750,000 fewer jobs at the end of this year. That's not my number. That's the Congressional Budget Office number. And I would point out, Mr. Chairman, that on the floor of the House just last year, uh, Majority Leader Cantor said that the sequester would result in 200,000 fewer jobs just in his state of Virginia. So this is happening right now. Uh, it's the jobs that would have been created that you don't see, 750,000. And because the Republican budget does not replace the sequester like our budget, they will, it will lead to that increased loss in jobs. Now, in addition to preventing that job loss, uh, our budget also invests now in our infrastructure, our transportation. Uh, we all know from looking around our communities that that needs important investment. Uh, it's important to keep our economy competitive. Uh, and we also have over 15% unemployment in the construction industry. So it's a win-win uh, to invest in jobs now. Uh, and if you look at the totality of that, um, our budget compared to uh, the proposed Republican budget will generate 1.2 trillion jobs this year uh, and 2 million more jobs. What did I say? I'm sorry. Correct it. Thank you for... Uh, 1.2 million jobs this year, thank you, and, and over 2 million jobs uh, next year. Uh, so our focus is, again, on getting the economy moving again and then reducing our deficit in a balanced way uh, going forward. So when it comes to tax policy, uh, we do not provide uh, this windfall tax break uh, to very wealthy people, uh, which we believe the math shows results in increasing taxes on middle class families by $3,000 each or not meeting the balanced budget uh, target. And nothing we have seen from our couple of Republican colleagues uh, can demonstrate uh, otherwise. Uh, we invest not only in K through 12 education, uh, but we prevent a doubling of the interest rate on student loans uh, that will take place this July uh, from 3.4 to 6.8 percent. Um, our Republican colleagues budget uh, assumes that that uh, interest rate uh, will go into effect or that there will be higher interest rates. With respect to seniors, look, uh, whether you call it a voucher or you call it a premium support, the idea is the same. The idea is that seniors will get um, a, 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 a thing of value. The problem is that the value, the problem is the value of that thing does not rise as rapidly as health care costs are rising. 
And therefore, seniors are left to eat the differences. Because the only way you can claim the savings in, in the revolving budget is if you cap that amount, uh, which is what we were told last year. Now we're told this year it's not capped. But if it's not capped, you can't claim uh, the out-year budget uh, savings. Medicaid. Medicaid. You know, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned uh, programs that help people with disabilities. The reality is one of those is Medicaid, as you know. And this Republican budget will cut Medicaid by a full third by that 10th year compared to where it is going in terms of meeting uh, current needs. And it block grants it. Uh, so it would eliminate all the requirements that are currently embedded in Medicaid. Uh, and this is at a time when Medicaid uh, is actually spending less per capita uh, in terms of rising costs uh, than any other, other uh, programs. Uh, and finally, we also, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do, we do preserve the benefits uh, from the Affordable Care Act, from Obamacare. Very important benefits that prevent people from being discriminated against if they have pre-existing conditions. Benefits that allow people to stay on their parents' insurance policies till the age of 26. The Republican budget eliminates all those benefits. But the reality is it does keep the level of revenues from Obamacare. So that's a trillion dollars. Now, if that's not in the budget, it doesn't tell us where it's going to make up the trillion dollars, which is why the Heritage Foundation, not just me, the Heritage Foundation criticized the Republican budget because it relied on that trillion dollars in revenue from Obamacare. But even setting that aside, it also includes the $715 billion in Medicare savings that we achieved through the Affordable Care Act by eliminating some of the overpayments to uh, private insurance companies and by modernizing the incentive structure. Now, if I recall last fall, uh, we were beaten over the head uh, with those uh, Medicare savings. Guess what? They're all in this budget. And guess what else? Without those Medicare savings, put aside the, the, the revenues, without those Medicare savings, this Republican budget is not in balance in 10 years. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we focus on jobs, we focus on getting the economy going, and we focus on reducing the deficit in a balanced way, such that by the 10th year, the deficits are way are growing way slower than economic growth. They're down to 2.4%. We stabilize the debt at 70% of GDP, uh, which is below the projected CBO uh, debt uh, right now, 70% of GDP. And we're on a path to balance by the same year as the House Republican budget was on last year, so, uh, which is around 2040. So uh, our budget will balance this year around the same date the Republican budget would balance last year. But we get the economy moving now, and we don't violate important commitments to our kids and to our seniors and to middle-income families. That's the way we see it, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, we have a big difference of opinion. The good thing is that the Budget Committee, uh, under the Chairman Ryan, we've been able to express uh, those differences sharply, uh, but in a civil manner. I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, and I know every member of this committee has numerous questions. By the way, it's a delight to have you both here because you've been debating these issues and making sure that you would come prepared full-time fund in the Budget Committee. Uh, my question really is for both of you, Paul. I'll go to you first as the chairman. Uh, but it's the same question. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen brought up uh, the Simpson-Bowles issue. And uh, essentially what he called balance, it's uh, maybe a two-for-one ratio uh, of uh, spending cuts and uh, taxation. Um, didn't we already do this last December? Didn't we already have a substantial tax increase? Yes. Were uh, there corresponding cuts? Right. So a trillion with the Obamacare law and then $617 billion with the fiscal cliff. So we've got about a $1.6 trillion tax increase that has just now taken place. Right. Um, he's probably right. I don't have the numbers in front of me by saying that he doesn't raise taxes as much as Simpson Bowles does. Because Simpson Bowles raises revenues up to 21% of GDP, then a trillion on top of that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they still, with that kind of revenue target, said they get tax rates down to the top tax rate being around 25%, 26%, I think, was their tax rate. What does that mean? That means there's a trillion dollars each and every year in loopholes in the tax code. Now, one person's loophole is another person's, you know, priority, but there's a trillion dollars a year in loopholes in the tax code. And so what we are saying is, number one, don't raise revenues as high as that. His budget, I'll just 
I assume he's correct. His budget doesn't raise as high as that. We're saying keep the current code revenues levels as they, where they are, but replace it with a flatter, fairer tax system that has fewer loopholes. And you have a trillion a year to choose from on where and how to bring those rates down so that they're more competitive, so that families and businesses can keep more of what they earn to have faster economic growth. There is a bipartisan consensus among centrist Democrats and Republicans that a key ingredient to growing the economy is lower tax rates and a broader tax base. This budget reflects that consensus. Now, it's not a consensus universal, but it's a consensus with what I would call moderate Democrats, like the Bipartisan Policy Center and others, who say lower tax rates is a key to economic growth. Um, I would also say, though, that um, his budget raises spending $476 billion above the current spending baseline and $1.2 trillion above that. So I don't know how you balance the budget ever, let alone 2040, unless you're making different assumptions that the CBO doesn't agree with. So an unintended consequence would not be balancing the budget. You would expect to go do that. Yeah, I don't think any of these budgets ever balance. And the only way you could make a claim, as far as I can tell, is you'd have to, you'd have, to have assumptions that would divert from what CBO believes to make that case. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Van Hollen? Well, let me um, start on the last point and then get to the earlier uh, question that you, you've got. Um, uh, number one, uh, the growth rates we assume for discretionary and mandatory are actually uh, higher growth rates in the out years than Chairman Ryan uh, uh, proposed and assumed in the budget he submitted uh, to the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, for review uh, last year, where they found it, uh, but it balanced around 2040. So we assume actually higher growth rates in those categories. We have seen dramatic uh, slowdown uh, in the rise of per capita health care costs. Uh, and CBO has not actually redone their baseline uh, to account for that. But if you look at their baseline that we're operating under right now for this budget window, uh, we actually project uh, growth rate no higher. Uh, in those categories than they have for that 10-year window. So, What is that rate? That's a GDP rate. Uh, and we are actually, uh, we've been growing at somewhat lower than GDP. This is a per capita rate. I want to say, uh, make it very clear. We, we, we do account entirely uh, for the demographic change and, and all the age shifting uh, as part of that. Uh, we have had outside groups uh, look at that, and they've reached uh, similar conclusions that we have. Now, with respect to uh, tax policy, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just, this was the Saturday headline in one of the Washington Post stories. Uh, Nonpartisan groups, GOP tax cuts would benefit the very wealthy. This isn't, this isn't House Democrats saying this. This is pretty much basic math. So it would be Washington Post saying it. No, no, no. This is not an editorial. This is an article. This is an article. This is an article. No, but it's the Washington Post. <laughs> I'm happy to respond if you'd like. I see. I see, Mr. Chair. Just so I understand, so what you're saying is because an article appeared in the Washington Post, it can't be. I, I, all I said is it's not yeah. Democrats, it's the Washington yeah. Post. Well, the gentleman that's that's right. all I'm suggesting. I'm happy to get into this if you'd like. The article was also Let's, in the New York Times. It's in the. <laughs> 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 that's good. All right. Uh, uh, no, what, I, I think it would also be. Please. I think you would also find in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Mr. Chairman, so. uh, because uh, yeah, yeah. Right. which is uh, which also has very good news analysis, frankly, um, because this is kind of math. Well, let me ask you. Let me ask the members of the committee. All right, this is kind of simple math, right? You got a top rate at thirty nine percent today, right? Now you do the math. You take someone who earns a million dollars a year and you drop that from thirty nine to twenty five percent. Okay. Everyone can see that when you take that first step, right, you lose a lot of revenue, right? And the estimates are for higher income individuals, it's around $4 trillion. That's the component. If you back out the Obamacare uh, uh, things that you kept in your budget but say you don't, but it's about $4 trillion. So you've got to make up for $4 trillion. Now, you know, Governor Romney faced this whole question throughout the campaign, uh, and he was never able to show how he was going to make up that revenue simply by closing tax deductions and expenditures on high-income people. And so the conclusion, again, was simple math. Either you don't do it in a deficit-neutral way, meaning you're going to uh, not have a bad budget that's imbalanced by that political target of 10 years, or you are increasing uh, taxes on middle-income people to finance 
tax breaks uh, for the wealthy. One of those two no, things no, no, no. has there's to be true. One. There's a third one. That is, you get full employment. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I and may. That's what, that's what George Chairman, Bush all, said. Let me just say, Mr. Chairman, all of our budgets are based on uh, the economic assumptions of the congressional uh, budget. Well, I, I agree with that, but so, there, is a, there is a third alternative in there, and that is you grow well, employment. Uh, Mr. M M Mr. Chairman, look, we could all we could all say that our you know ours growth more quickly than the CBO uh, baseline. Ours makes ours does, as I say, have a jobs plan which the CBO would acknowledge would increase uh, job growth this year because we replaced the sequester. Uh, that's 750,000 more jobs by itself by the end of this year. And then, as I said, we project another two million dollar two million jobs compared to the Republican budget uh, next year because we don't only focus on the long term; we also focus on the here and now. We focus on both. Uh, Paul, a um, couple things uh, that I think. It's a TPC study he's talking about in that article. So it was just probably a wire story on the TPC study, which may have even run in the Wall Street Journal and maybe even Investors Business Daily. Uh, so what it does is it makes up their own assumptions about what we're proposing. Doesn't even It wasn't even a measurement of the Republican budget. It was, here's what we assume the Republican budget will or won't do, and therefore this is our analysis. Back to the point I was making with Bull Simpson. Bull Simpson... Um, chose to target 21% of, of GDP for revenues and then a trillion dollars on top of it and still delivered the top tax rate of 26%. The point I'm making is we're targeting 19.1% of GDP at the end of the window and clearly we can show lower tax rates with a broader tax base without losing revenues. Now it's the job of the ways means could, to do that. We are not trying to tell <clears throat> the Commerce Committee exactly how they do their Medicaid proposal <clears throat> or the Ways and Means Committee exactly how to do the tax proposal. But the numbers clearly show that you can achieve these goals of lower tax rates with a broader tax base, meaning fewer loopholes, while still hitting these revenue targets. And so what that study does is it makes up all of these assumptions that don't, aren't affixed to our budget to make that point. That's point number one. Point number two, um, the jobs numbers you hear from CBO. Um, this is what we call the Keynesian multiplier. Uh, without getting too technical into it, it's the same um, methodology and measuring stick that was used to say that the stimulus would create all of these jobs. If you plug in government spending here, you'll get all these jobs over there. And so they're using the same methodology, which has already been disproven with the stimulus. There have been study after study showing it doesn't work that way uh, to make this claim of 2 million jobs. With respect to Virginia and the 200,000 jobs as resulting from the sequester, that was, a, I would argue, a more specific analysis to threats to the defense industry, which Virginia is so uh, you know, reliant upon. And this budget prevents those cuts in the defense, uh, from the defense side of the aisle because we, again, as I mentioned, we have the highest line of defense spending of all of these budgets. The Van Halen budget takes the current defense line and drops it by $224 billion out of the base budget. The Murray budget in the Senate, $250 billion. The Progressive Caucus drops defense spending by $546 billion. The Black Caucus has the lowest cut to defense, $130 billion. We don't do that uh, in our budget. We preserve this because we think this is, this is you know, the, number one, the primary important function of the federal government. Number two, those job loss numbers that are attributed to Virginia and the other states due to the sequester, they're the ones who are cutting that budget even farther than where we are today. Well, I find the uh, the interest level. Uh, if the gentleman would like time, you re please remember we're all trying to get him out of here in an hour. We know we do not number one. Number one, at this point in time, when the economy is still struggling to get back on its feet, we do not uh, take any of the, the, those cuts uh, in defense uh, because uh, the economy is still in the period where it's trying. Uh, to recover, and that's exactly when you do not want to make these cuts. Secondly, I, I've always found this kind of theology that um, you, when you don't spend money um, building an aircraft carrier, that costs jobs, which obviously does, but if you don't spend money uh, for somebody who's doing scientific research or building roads or bridges, that somehow that doesn't save jobs. And the reality is the recovery bill prevented uh, the economy from falling uh, through the floor uh, for the very reasons that this proposal uh, will also uh, prevent those uh, job losses that CBO 
uh, talks about. So uh, yeah, I think it's important to, to, to recognize that when it comes to jobs, <laughs> you can get jobs from building highways and transit systems, just like you can get jobs from building aircraft carriers. And you tell me why you can get jobs with one and one without the other, I would be really interested to know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I think the jobs that we're after are private sector jobs, because that's how you net things out and make it better. Mrs. Fox, uh, Dr. Fox. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Ryan, I, I want to thank you and the members of the Budget Committee for um, completing this challenging task that you have completed in, in getting a budget resolution to us. Um, the Senate's been dithering for the past four years, but you all have continued to lay out a vision of limited government which increases opportunities for Americans. And I want to thank you and the staff um, for what you've done. The President's budget is now six weeks late. Uh, many people have said this is a failure of leadership. And it's a failure to meet his responsibility under the Budget Act. Could you comment on how that failure has made the task before your committee uh, in crafting the budget resolution more difficult? Yeah, well, the budget law requires that the President submit his budget on the first Monday of February. Uh, he has missed that deadline um, uh, four to five times now. Um, now to the point where it's never been this late since the Modern Budget Act has been in place since 1974. Um, one of the things that we need to do to write our budget is um, we get uh, the refined baseline after the President's budget. So. The way it works is Congressional Budget Office has their new annual baseline. We call it the January baseline. Then the President submits his budget. Then they reanalyze re his budget, rescore it. And that gives us the final, far more uh, detailed baseline that we use to write our budgets with. We can't write um, budgets off of that baseline until he submits his budget. So he hasn't submitted a budget. We don't have that baseline yet. So we decided we couldn't just wait for whenever the budget would arrive. Uh, we only found out recently that he was now planning on submitting it April 8th. So we're using the February, uh, the January baseline, which came in February from CBO. So that, from the get-go, uh, makes it more difficult, uh, makes us less specific on the baseline that we would like to have had. More to the point was, is it doesn't provide leadership. I mean, we have a fiscal crisis. I don't think people would deny that. Yet, the biggest problem facing our economy, and the President of the United States, where the law says you need to propose solutions, has chosen not to do so. And so here we are. We'll put our plan out there first. Most people interpret this as a political move. We just had an election. I'm pretty familiar with the last election. I would like to get on to the problem-solving part. Um, the point I would also make, though, in, his, in Mr. Van Hollen's credit is he always put up a budget. When we were putting our budgets up, he was always putting up budgets. The other body in the Senate didn't do that. It's the first time in four years that the Senate has done a budget. Where I feel like we're not in a Groundhog Day you know, mode here is the fact that the Senate's actually doing a budget. Now, I'm not a big fan of their budget because I think it makes matters worse. More taxes, even more spending, deep defense cuts, but overwhelmed by the domestic spending increases. At least they're doing a budget, finally. And so what I get out of this is a process is continuing like it was intended where the House passes a budget, the Senate passes a budget, then we start continuing and talking and trying to get a solution at the end of the day. So at least regular order is being restored. At least the process is going here in Congress. The President hasn't submitted his budget yet. So he's been sort of on the outside of this conversation, showing the least amount of leadership where in the past he would submit a budget, the House would pass a budget, and the Senate hasn't. So we've gone from the Senate stepping up to honoring its responsibilities to the President not honoring his responsibility to submit a budget. So, you know, we're still two for three. Um, it, I'm very puzzled by the comment the President made the other day that he doesn't want to have a balanced budget for the sake of balance. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really make sense to me since a balanced budget is the way the average family has to operate. Do you have any, any comments on what in the world that must mean? No, don't balance for the sake of balance? I think it means that they're not going to provide, they're not going to bring a budget. 
out on April 8th that ever balances. The Senate budget never balances. As, as Mr. Van Hollen just noted, he had to put new assumptions into his budget than what CBO would currently certify to show that he's ever actually balancing. Heck, I'd love to take those assumptions added to our budget and, you know, show health inflation going down. Um, we will have a difference of opinion at the end of the day about how to go after the root cause of health inflation. I really don't think the health care law is going to address it. I think it's going to exacerbate it. I think there are patient-centered reforms that will actually get at the root cause of health inflation. But we can't just assume that these, these things are going to continue on and therefore our budgets will balance. Um, what I think the President is basically saying is he's going to give you a status quo budget. He's going to give you a status quo where he's not proposing any substantial changes to fix this problem, to get to balance, to pay off the debt in the future. Um, we have done that for a number of years, only to be met with criticism, not with counter proposals. Um, so I'm hoping this year will be a little different. Would you talk a little bit more? I know you've, you've um, spoken to this a little bit, but would you talk a little bit more about the fact that this, the Senate Democrats' budget doesn't include any long-term budgeting and, and, and talk a little bit more about the the importance of planning for the long term in the budget resolution. Well, yeah, they don't, they don't propose any entitlement reforms. You have to remember that Medicare Part A trust fund goes bankrupt in 2023. You have to know that Social Security goes insolvent, it bankrupt by 2033. Um, it's, it's not a Republican-Democrat thing. It's just a math thing. We're going from 40 million retirees to 80 million retirees approximately within a generation. And the cost of these programs go up above inflation or above the, the, the economic growth. And so that's why we have a debt crisis coming. Our debt is projected to go into the stratosphere as the size of our economy. That will destroy our economy. We know that. This is not really refutable. And so we're saying, let's get ahead of it right now. Let's put the necessary reforms so they're phased in. The reforms we're proposing don't change the benefits for anybody in or near retirement. But in order to make good on those promises to current seniors, in order to make sure that my generation and my kids' generation actually have a program for when they retire, a guaranteed medical and, and retirement program, you've got to make necessary changes now because the alternative is the debt gets too big, the economy goes down, we have a crisis, the bond markets turn on us, interest rates go up, and then we're cutting indiscriminately across the board in real time that affects current seniors after they've retired, current safety net, people who are on the safety net. That's what we're trying to avoid in the first place. So to say that this is the pain and austerity budget, no, 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 no. The status quo is pain and austerity. It is the pain and austerity that comes with the debt crisis that we're trying to preempt and prevent with this budget in the first place. I, I was struck by Mr. Van Holland comparing what he's doing with his budget to the Simpson-Bowles recommendation saying that, well, it raises taxes less than Simpson-Bowles uh, recommends. I'm not sure if that's worshiping at the altar of bipartisanship. That's what it sounded like to me. But it seems to me, again, that the, I don't know how the logicians would call, talk about this, but instead of comparing it to the other budgets, to what you're doing, um, he says, you know, again, it's, well, it's less than Simpson-Bowles recommended. But as my understanding, there's no entitlement reform in that budget either. Is there's that no health care entitlement reform. Since Bowles had a Social Security reform plan, um, Alice Rivlin and I, who are members of the Bowles, Simpson Bowles Commission, she's a Democrat, obviously I'm a Republican, she and I had an amendment to Simpson Bowles to do a premium support for Medicare and um, I'm not supposed to say block renting. I know people don't like that word, but block renting Medicaid. Uh, it was bipartisan, but it was rejected in the committee. And as a result, there really wasn't any significant health care entitlement reform to Simpson Bowles. And as we all well know, the driver of our future debt crisis is health care entitlement spending. Um, but I think Mr. Van Halen's, I think he's right that his revenues aren't as high as Simpson Bowles, but he's also making my point on our tax reform. The, the, the Simpson Bowles put out two different plans, one with tax expenditures for the middle income taxpayers, and the top rate was 28%. Then it had what they called the zero plan, where they got rid of all tax expenditures, and the top rate was 23% of income taxes. And they did that by targeting a revenue line that was two whole percentage points above the revenue line we're targeting, and then a trillion dollar tax increase on top of it. So clearly, we can hit 
lower tax rates while maintaining important middle income tax expenditures that are broad based not special interests that are broad based and hit our revenue line so i think he's making the point for our tax reform plan and i think he's probably accurate even though i don't have the numbers in front of me that his tax he doesn't raise taxes as much as they do one more quick point that i i think you're making and there's been some criticism of some republicans who said well we don't have an immediate crisis but if I could summarize what you've been saying, um, the, it's going to get worse if we don't deal with it now. And then it will become a crisis. That, and it won't take very long until it is a crisis. That's right. I mean, look, the CBO even says so in their long-term report, saying it's coming. Um, and it's, it's dangerous. And lenders will stop believing that we're going to be able to pay that back their money. Therefore, they'll charge higher interest rates. The problem with a debt crisis is you never know when the bond markets are going to turn on you. You know, we've had bond market problems. They call it the bond market vigilantes. You know, we had problems in the 80s. You now see what's going on in Europe, and you saw bond market problems across the board. Greece, Spain, Italy, France, all of them. And so we don't want to tempt that fate. We don't want to even get close to that because what happens when your interest rates shoot up your interest expenses go up so high that that's the biggest part of your budget. If interest rates return to where they were before our economic crisis in 2008 occurred, we would have about a $400 billion jump just this year alone in interest payments. We don't want that to happen. The purpose of doing this budget is to prevent that from happening and get ahead of our problems. See it coming. Prevent it from happening. Don't tempt fate. And if you keep taxing, slowing down your economy, borrowing and spending even more money, then you'll tempt that fate and you'll hasten a debt crisis. That's the point we're trying to make. Well, thank you again and to your great staff. I think uh, uh, you all do a wonderful job and I appreciate the articulate way that you present it to the American people. I think they believe you. I think they know that what you're saying is the truth. And uh, our, our big problem, of course, is not convincing the American people. It's convincing the Senate and the President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you. I appreciate both of you a lot. Um, but um, as we prepare to vote to kill health care for the 35th time, uh, I think about what Chris Wallace said. That's not going to happen. Uh, and I know that you didn't want to believe what we had in the newspaper columns, but I was impressed with the fact that both you and Speaker Boehner said over the weekend that we do not face a debt crisis. We're not in it. So I'm, I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Van Hollen, who looks somewhat uh, bemused at that uh, prospect. And, and I'd like to know, Mr. Van Hollen, what you think about uh, uh, what we're trying to do if we're not creating debt crises with this uh, lurching from one crisis to the next here. Uh, and if there's confusion in the bond market and the Wall Street, it's... Uh, the Rules Committee isn't doing anything to help allay those fears. Well, thank you, um, uh, Mrs. Slaughter, and uh, thank you for your, your leadership. And there's no doubt that this uh, constant jump from one manufactured crisis to another is uh, taking a toll uh, on the economy. Uh, we, we know from people, whether they're in the defense industry or other industries, uh, that the uh, First, the threat of the sequester. Now, the sequester is creating a slowdown. I mean, I just got a letter uh, two days ago from a major biotech uh, company in my district. Uh, said that they had already been laying off more than a thousand people over the last couple of years because of the slowdown. They've now imposed a hiring freeze. But guess what? They're hiring in China, not because of lower wages in China, but because the Chinese government looked at what the United States did with respect to investing in our biosciences and said, "Hey, that's a pretty good idea." And so they're doing that while we're, we're cutting back. In fact, the, the Republican budget here would more than double the sequester cut to those areas of the budget where we make those investments. More than double the sequester to the part of the budget that goes to science and research and NIH and those kind of places. Now, let me say a word about this tax reform proposal that has now been in this Republican budget for the third year. We keep saying, they keep telling us it can be done. But three years later, the Ways and Means Committee hasn't shown us one piece of paper to show us one deduction that they would eliminate. Not one. It's been three years. Three years and nothing. It's like with respect to the Affordable Care Act. They have a bill called Repeal and Replace, where they repeal the benefits 
There's nothing to replace it three years later. So when you repeal it, you will repeal all those benefits I talked about to provide more affordable coverage for people and to make sure people aren't discriminated against based on pre-existing conditions. So, you know, it's, it's easy to keep saying you can come up with $5.7 trillion in tax expenditures as part of tax reform. We'll do it. So, you know, this is, this is the challenge we've got going forward. Um, Speaker Boehner said he had a plan to raise $800 billion by eliminating tax expenditures. We'd like to see it. It can be part of a, a balanced approach. Uh, yes, we obviously need to deal with two things. We need to get the economy moving again. And the austerity budget that's proposed by our Republican colleagues would put a drag on the economy. But we also need to reduce our long-term deficits in a, in a balanced and measured way. And we believe our budget does exactly that. Now, let me just say a word about the, the, the long-term debt. Obviously, we need to address that. It's also important to keep it in perspective. Um, the chart that uh, my Republican colleagues used when they released their budget shows the old CBO alternative fiscal scenario, which is why factcheck.com said that using that chart in this year's budget was, quote, a debt exaggeration. This is an independent fact-checking group. The reality is we have made significant strides, but we got a lot long farther to go. Now, our budget will, when you take the totality of the actions that we've taken before and in this year, we will reduce the, the deficit by over $4 trillion. Uh, and we do it in a, in a balanced way uh, going forward. Uh, and so... I believe, actually, if you look at the CBO, uh, what they're going to come up with, they're going to have to adjust uh, their projections with respect to the rate of growth of healthcare care spending. Um, and uh, I think it will be very consistent with the proposals that we're talking about. We, 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 will, we will see. But bottom line, um, I don't, uh, Ranking Member Slaughter, is that uh, we've got to deal with the jobs issue, and we've got to do it now. Mm -hmm. And a major contrast between our proposal and our Republican colleagues' proposal is we get at the heart of that issue right now. And as I said in my opening remarks, that jobs deficit is directly related to the budget deficit. So we attack the jobs deficit right away as we get at the budget deficit in a smart, measured way over a long period of time. Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. I have uh, been sort of... Uh in my own mind, very much concerned with the fact that the infrastructure in the United States is falling apart. Um, and heard an expert say that there are literally bridges in the United States now that he would not drive over. And we talk about jobs, and now you do have, I think, in, in your budget, you're talking about spending some money on infrastructure? Yes, we have uh, two important pieces. I, you know, the idea that we do have people desperate for work and that we can't even consider are uh, doing something out there until bridges start to collapse all over the country, and then we'll go into this great flurry of, oh, dear, we didn't mean that to happen. Well, you're right. It's, uh, it's roads, it's bridges, it's transit systems. It's the kind of things that our global competitors are doing every day uh, to modernize their infrastructure so they have a, a backbone uh, to transport uh, goods and services. Now, do you know that the only airport that has been built in the United States of America from the ground up since 1972 is Stapleton in Denver. We've expanded them and we've changed them and made them improved them. But we have so far behind and, and the, the, the rail situation in the United States is pretty deplorable. Well, you know, the American Society of Civil Engineers is apparently coming up with their next report card, I believe, tomorrow. Uh, but their report card up to today uh, gave us a big fat D uh, in our infrastructure grade. And so, you know, this is an opportunity for a win-win, right? We could, we could help modernize our infrastructure and put people back to work. You got over 15 percent unemployment in the construction industry. One of the major problems when we're not looking forward is that we're not thinking about things like that, that we need to meet those needs of the United States just simply to keep it going. Uh, and uh, and we, as we keep talking about cut, 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 uh, and to the point where uh, we literally, I think, are, are going to be facing some serious problems with the bridges and uh, infrastructure failures. In my own town, city of Rochester, the water system, it's about 100 years old. We managed to get by with it. But we've neglected ourselves terribly, and uh, 
I was uh, very mindful of that as during all those years we were paying $2 billion a week uh, for the war that now 10 years later most people think we shouldn't have been doing in the first place. So I'd like to see some sensibility brought here and really decide what it is we have to do and get together. This body is obviously capable of doing that. Thank you, Mr. Van Allen. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Thank you uh, very much, gentlemen from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, unlike many in this particular room, I don't have an independent source of wealth. I do live from paycheck to paycheck, so it is my goal to get this as quickly to the floor as possible and passed um, so that we can uh, replicate the discussion on the floor of these bills instead of here. And I hope that we certainly can have several different versions of this on the floor for that debate. So with that in, in respect, I want to just ask one stupid question and then a short statement. So if you could answer me a question just about the committee's budget that's presented here. When I read the Woodward book, I was surprised that one of the first proposals that Jack Lou presented was to do a 12-year budget or a 12-year proposal instead of 10 so that the numbers would look better and you could put the cuts in the out years hoping that a future Congress would not actually do it. Are there any such gimmicks in the committee's version? No, we, we do 10-year budget. And we show exactly up front what our numbers are and the policies and assumptions needed to achieve those. And we put more levels of specificity in our budgets than any in the past, especially, look, the reason he's saying all these things about our Medicare proposal is we put all these details out there as to how we achieve these things. So, no, uh, we, we put all the specifics in there. We don't have um, what I would call some end of the of the window gimmick to drop your numbers to make them look a good. A balloon effect. Thank you. Yep. Um, I do. I have had questions in the past and probably will that deal with uh, federal employees as far as their salaries as well as their retirement. I think we can do some things that I think would be creative to reach the numbers you're talking about without having to do something that affects everybody equally. And I look forward to working with you on those kinds of issues in the future. With that, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I will yield back and apologize for what I said in the Resources Committee. <laughs> I have not forgotten that. <laughs> and I, thank, I thank the gentleman. Uh, continuing down the pathway for efficiency at the Rules Committee, the gentleman from uh, Worcester, Massachusetts is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Rules Chairman Ryan and Ranking Member Van Hollen for being here, as always. And, you know, I, you know, I have seen this movie before. Uh, I didn't like it the first time, and I, didn't li I liked it even less the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, now we're at the seventh time. Um, and I kind of hope that, given the fact that you mentioned there was an election, the election, you know, uh, uh, happened, that uh, that rather than kind of doubling down on the same old, same old, that maybe there would be a recognition that, um, you know, there needs to be some compromise. Um, and I really don't see that in the, in the Republican budget, uh, and I regret that very much. And... You know, and I, and I, I was kind of hoping that, if, if nothing else, that after this election that, you know, some of the, you know, just the, the, the kind of blatant politics could be kind of put aside for just a moment, especially as we talked about the budget. We all have different priorities, and there's, there's no secret about, you know, kind of differences in ideology and philosophy. You know, um, you know the uh, chairman speaks of regular order, and, um, you know, and I, and I have my good friend Mr. Mulvaney from South Carolina is here. I'm, I'm looking at his amendments, uh, I guess the President's uh, budget with a bunch of question marks in it, and uh, the Senate uh, budget, uh, which hasn't even been brought to the floor yet, we're going to vote on it here before they had a chance to even, you know, amend it on the floor. It just seems to me that I, I don't think that that encourages the spirit of, of bipartisanship and compromise that I think people are looking for right now. And, um, you know, and I, uh, you know, and again, I'll just say, you know, Mr. Mr. Rowan, when I look at your budget, it, it, you know, I, I can't help but feel that notwithstanding the fact that you say that everyone has to make tough choices, that uh, the toughest choices are being made by the people who at least can afford it. Um, I don't see anything in your budget that would cause Donald Trump to have any heartburn. I don't see any tough decisions he has to make. But, you know, if the, um, you know, if some of the analyses that we're, I'm reading from, again, not from the, the, uh, the Democrats here, but from some of the independent organizations about what what the cuts would be to the SNAP program, for example, um, it would be pretty substantial. And, um, you know, and, and, and i and I, got, I got to tell you, I think if government is here for anybody, it needs to be here for those people who have nothing. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, notwithstanding a lot of 
demonization of the, of the SNAP program. It is one of the most efficiently run programs of the federal government, one of the lowest uh, error rates. Um, and the reason why so many the spending has gone up is because we're, we've just come through one of the worst recessions uh, in our history. It's counter-cyclical. When the economy gets better, the amount of spending on SNAP goes down less. And I, I'd also point out to you just, you know, uh, that uh, you know, we've got 50 million people in this country who are hungry. Uh, and, um, you know, there was a time in the 1970s that we came close to eliminating hunger in this country. Uh, bipartisan efforts. George McGovern and Robert Dole came together and worked on uh, programs that actually had an impact. I would argue, we could argue what happened after that. I, I, I tell you that a lot of those programs were dismantled and, um, and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the connections that were established between agencies and, and um, you know, and organizations uh, ceased to exist. And as a result, uh, you know, I, I think our whole war on poverty, I agree with you, it could be, it could be waged in a much more effective way. But I don't think that you're going to, you know, be able to wage an effective war on poverty by saying to the states, here, you take care of it. You know, um, it's, it's your problem. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to wash our hands of that, and you'll, you'll figure all that out. Um, and, um, and again, and with, the, with the cutbacks in the SNAP program over, over 10 years, it's pretty substantial. So, um, you know, I, I also want to associate myself with the remarks of our, our ranking member here. I mean, you know, part of the way you get this economy going again um, is through investment. I worry about cutbacks in, you know, national, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, things that keep us, you know, keep innovation alive in this country. Uh, and I worry about those being cut. Um, you know, I'm, I understand the importance of deficit reduction, but deficit reduction in and of itself is not an economic policy. It's, it's, that's, not the, that's not it. There's, there's other parts to it. And um, so, I mean, I, I will also associate myself with the remarks of the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop, uh, when he says he assumes that everybody will have an opportunity to be, offer their views on the floor. We'll have, we'll have a vigorous debate. But, you know, I, I, just, I just worry that we're starting at a point where we're either, we, I feel like we're even farther apart this year than we were last year. Uh, and um, and I, I regret that very much because I, I think we, we've got some problems here and we're going to have to enact things here in Congress that um, can pass both chambers and that can get signed by the President. Otherwise, we're not going to do anything. And I just say one final thing, and I go back to a point that Mr. Van Hollen raised before. I mean, I, I you know, I, maybe... I'm, 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 I think the most urgent thing we could do right now uh, is fix the sequester. Um, and I'm going to give you, give you just one example of what's, what's happening in my, in my community. We have a regional airport that is uh, struggling to, uh, to get off the ground. We've got interest now. All of a sudden, you know, we have airlines that are interested in locating at this regional airport, which is going to only create more jobs, but it will be a catalyst for economic development. We've got businesses that are interested in moving into my part of the state because of the transportation. You know, th their air traffic tower is going to be shut down um, in the next few weeks, which I can't, I, I can't think of a bigger disincentive for airlines to want to invest in a regional airport uh, other than your air traffic tower uh, will, be, will, 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 not, uh, will not exist anymore. So I, anyway, I, look, I, we will have this debate on the floor. I respect your opinion and your philosophy, but I, I kind of feel like we're farther apart this year than we were last year. And I think after this election, the opposite should have happened. So I hope that uh, maybe this process will yield some sort of a compromise. Uh, but, um, you, know, uh, you know, again, I just, the final thing I'm going to say here is, you know, th these cuts to programs that benefit poor people, they're harsh. And, um, you know, I know you, you've got you know, uh, talking points to try to explain them away, but they're really harsh. And, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and I, again, I think that's, if government is here for anything, it needs to be here for those who are the most vulnerable. And I, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. McGovern. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you two again. I spent so many hours with you at the Budget Committee, I don't uh, feel like I need to probe too deeply into this particular budget. But, I do want to make a couple of points, and first I want to thank both of you for the work you do on that committee and how hard that committee works, staff, a number of their members here, both majority and minority, just done, I think, an exceptional job, and uh, 
even though we disagree on things, I think you both uh, and your respective sides and staffs have elevated this debate dramatically in the last several years in a way that it needs to happen. I think uh, this conversation we need to have an ongoing sense, and you both uh, contributed mightily to that, and I appreciate it very much. And I actually uh, uh, think the country will get a very good education uh, if it cares to listen uh, as we work through this, uh, this process. Um, I wish, honestly, the President were a little bit more deeply engaged in doing that as well, but he'll eventually get a budget, and I, I would just like to see him talk about these issues with a little bit more specificity. Both of you do that, and uh, I'm not convinced that the most important voice in the room does do that as frequently and uh, as uh, 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 with as much uh, precision as he should. Um, I know the Republican budget pretty well. Uh, I'm not as familiar, Mr. Van Hollen, with the Democratic budget. And something you said did raise a question. Uh, where you, you mentioned your budget balances in 2003 that you, you specify faster growth rates than the CBO. Where did you get those? If I'm and if I misunderstood, please correct me. Uh, where did you get those those uh, figures? Because I know you got them someplace. And and walk me through why you think the economy will grow faster than CBO. Uh, yeah, I think, Mr. Cole, first of all, thank you for your earlier comments, and it is great uh, to work with you on the Budget Committee. No, I think you must have misunderstood me. I, we, don't ex we don't assume any different economic uh, Good growth. We, we have the same CBO uh, 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 economic growth numbers. Okay, then let me ask was you. Slower, wasn't it slower uh, health care cost growth in the other years? Not, not, in, not, not that in the current... 10-year CBO windows. C yeah, but that's the same, but, Mr. Chairman, that's the same out years that, as this factcheck.org pointed out, led to um, an exaggeration in the whole Republican budget. So C CBO, when they redid their uh, analysis of health care growth for the current 10-year window that we're in, um, showed that those reduced dramatically. In, in, in fact, um, we have both, in our budgets, significantly benefited from the fact that in the last couple of years, CBO has significantly uh, changed its estimate of per capita yeah, growth cost. rates. Yeah, excess cost. But, but just to be clear, there's, there's a, a couple of reasons why the Republican budget has been able to get toward this, what I, I would argue is a political target of balance. But one, of course, is the uh, revenue from the fiscal cliff agreement. But the other thing is over the last couple of years, we've seen hundreds of billions of dollars of reduction in the baseline because of slower health care cost growth, which we would argue is at least in part due to the fact that the Affordable Care Act has begun to help uh, bend the, the cost curve uh, in, in that area. If I, if I may, I, I think I might argue at least one of the contributing factors was the Medicare Part D reform that was pushed through. How accurate was the CBO in estimating its cost 10 years ago? They were off by 41 percent off their projections. Um, another one of the ex uh, reasons the explanation of the excess cost growth, cost growth has slowed down is because of the recession, the bad economy. Yeah. Right. Now, if so I could I, just, well, yeah, just yeah, please, if I may. It, there's no doubt that when you have a slower economy, obviously people spend a little less on everything. But uh, there is, more, according to most experts that have looked at it, there's more than just that uh, going on. It's, it's it, good news. Yeah. I, it is I, good I, news, I, and it is already reflected, I, I, as I, I said. I always uh, like to point it, out it, when it, these Republican revolutionary I, I, ideas for Medicare actually yield greater savings than the CBO estimated by a lot. Well, not yeah. by a little. And isn't that pretty much the same sort of mechanism you look at applying to the entire Medicare system? Yes. I, I'm, I'm happy to comment on that if, <laughs> if I can have a chance. I don't want to prolong this, but what, sure. what happened in the prescription drug uh, area was that because of the introduction of generics to the entire market, you saw dramatic, uh, you saw reductions, and, and, and that was the primary cause of the move. Secondly, there's a huge difference between how prescription drug Part D is done and federal employee health benefits are done and the premium support, voucher plan, whatever you want to call it, called for in the Republican budget. And the fundamental difference is this. In both prescription drug Part D and the federal employee's health benefit plan, the premium support that comes to federal employees and members of Congress 
has a fixed percentage. It's between 72 and 75 percent, regardless of how health care costs rise. Whereas in the proposal put forward on the voucher plan, there is not a fixed percentage. That's why there's not real premium support. Support would be you guarantee that the amount you get keeps up with the rise proportionally with rising health care costs. But that is not what happens in that plan. You can't respond. Yeah, yeah, look, I know we have to vote. But I, I probably should jump in on that. Sorry, there's feedback oh, sorry. here. Um, what we say is the plans bid every year for a senior citizen's business and they have to have benefits that meet Medicare's requirements, equivalent to this comprehension of the benefits you have right now with traditional Medicare. And then you get at least the, the bottom two bids or traditional Medicare. So what I'm saying is every single year the plans have to bid to meet these benefits and they say, I can deliver this benefit to Medicare beneficiaries at X price. That sets the premium support right there. So the premium support rises every single year to reflect the cost of producing the benefits that are guaranteed in Medicare now and into the future. So that, this is an idea that came from Alice Rivlin at the Brookings Institute about how best to structure premium support to maintain the purchasing power of the benefit for future seniors. And more importantly, like the Part D benefit, we believe seniors ought to have choices. A choice of guaranteed coverage options to pick from for their Medicare benefit, including the traditional program if they want to keep that. And that act of choice and competition, like it did in Part D, helps maximize customer satisfaction, bring down prices, inject competition into the system so we can stretch our dollar farther, keeping up with cost growth, and maximizing the ability to choose. We think that's far better than the future of Medicare run by 15 people the President's about to appoint on its independent payment advisory board, this IPAB will make the decisions instead of the senior under our, on our view. And more to the point, this doesn't even affect current seniors. It doesn't even affect people who were born before 1958 and on 1958. We're phasing it in because if we go now, we can guarantee that the program is as it's now designed that current seniors have organized their lives around. If we keep kicking this can down the road, if we keep going deeper and deeper into debt with Medicare, then we won't be able to do that kind of a thing. We won't be able to give people a heads up. You'll be cutting them in real time, which is what they're doing in Europe, which is what, what we're trying to avoid. I know we have to vote, so I'll keep it at that. Mr. Well, Cole, we could go on for hours on this, but in the interest of time. I think I've heard you both go on for hours. Uh, but I am on the budget committee. That's uh, one hour. That's uh, right. Yeah, you are. <laughs> and I'll, I'll end quickly with this, but, uh, but you both do it very well. You know, it's a good debate. It's a fair debate. Uh, and you, you, again, you both have genuinely elevated uh, the quality of the discussion on what I think is the most important issue that we're facing. You're both to be commended for that, and uh, we'll have an interesting week here. Uh, but with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back because I've had the benefit of hearing this debate, and uh, I'm anxious other people have the chance to participate. I thank uh, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Chairman, you and uh, some members of the committee that have been here a long time uh, like me, you've heard me make this statement, but um, uh, Dr. Burgess and my colleague from Florida, uh, Ms. Ross Latham, and has not. Well, you, you, th then you will understand what I mean when I say my favorite program when I was a child was Let's Pretend. It was 65 years ago. Most of you were not born. And I used to lay up on Saturdays and listen to that program. When I came to Congress, I was an avid reader of biographies and autobiographies. And I guess listening to so many uh, budgeteers, and I think you guys ought to be gardeners, um, because you get all in the weeds, and we seem to um, uh, somehow or another uh, lose people with the green eye shade talk, and that's on either side. Um, but. Uh, I, I then switched from biographies and autobiographies to fiction. And I've said this um, uh, to Chris, and uh, I've said it to Paul, uh, that in large measure, while I respect and I do the extraordinary work that you all do, and uh, echoing the sentiments of others that have pointed uh, to staff, I think that um, uh, both staffs, uh, do an incredible job. And my disappointment is uh, that you all are not sequestered, uh, <laughs> to use the term properly, 
um, uh, and uh, allowed to work in a meaningful way together through many of the difficulties that both of you understand perhaps better than all of us combined. Uh, and I, I suggest that for the whole of Congress, uh, the 535 of us ought to be sequestered until we come up with some reasonable solutions, primary among them being some way of going about creating jobs in this country. The most humane budget uh, that uh, is likely to be on the floor is the Congressional Black Caucus budget. I won't make uh, uh, the case for it. Uh, Mr. Scott does that better than anybody that I know. Um, and it contemplates um, uh, what Mr. McGovern talked about, uh, and that is how uh, uh, people are, uh, are going to be hurt um, and, and tries to do something about it. Let me ask both of you. Um, I also learned as a little boy in school, it used to be one of our little dirty jokes about when you assume something, what it does to you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and and I, I, I'm, I'm troubled um, uh, by um, uh, these things because I've seen the reality banish uh, assumptions overnight. Uh, one of the crippling aspects in our economy that isn't talked about very much that led into um, uh, the thing that I like to talk about, the wars that were unpaid for. But before those wars were unpaid for, we suffered the devastation of 911. It had a very crippling effect on uh, our economy at that time period. And it didn't matter very much about who the president was. And let me make it also very clear about uh, our deficits and why I don't share the concern of many who do. Uh, Ronald Reagan raised the debt ceiling 18 times, a 67% increase. Um, George W. Bush raised it seven times. So far, Obama has raised it six times with a 31% increase. Um, I just uh, offer that because it seems, uh, and the question I wanted to put to you, Paul, is when other presidents, Democrats and Republicans, raised the debt ceiling, were they imperiling the children of that period? Elsie, it depends on the size of the debt relative to the size of the, of the economy. And so there comes a, a point where the debt gets so big relative to your economy that it really does threaten your prosperity. Uh, there have been lots of data and studies on when your debt gets to about 90% of your gross domestic product, and our total debt is over 100% right 100%. now, mm -hmm. it really starts threatening your economy. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's not who, it's just how big relative to your size okay. of the economy that matters. Okay. Then did either or both of you take into consideration um, uh, the fact um, uh, that there are some who are saying uh, that we may become the world's leading um, a producer of oil and gas, and in addition thereto, might very well uh, rival uh, many of the Middle Eastern um, uh, countries in oil exportation. Did you all contemplate that at all as an assumption? Uh, not as an assumption, but we put in our budget opening up American uh, natural resources, oil and gas and coal, but we had to use CBO's assumptions. CBO assumes, I'm doing this off the top of my head, that we get about $11 billion in revenues over the 10-year window. Uh, I'm doing that one off the top of my head. $11 billion over 10 year by opening up uh, natural gas and oil. Um, we think it's far higher than that, far higher than that, but we don't put our own preferences or assumptions in there. We just go with CBO, and they say $11 billion. All right. Let me talk with you, uh, Mr. Ryan, about tax, the tax cuts in your budget and how they're financed. Uh, regarding individual tax cuts, your budget says, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it would lower the top tax rate to 25 percent, repeal the alternative minimum tax, and also repeal the taxes on upper income households enacted as part of the Affordable uh, Care Act. So based on the Tax Policy Center's analysis, this is at least, and I believe Mr. Van Hollen made this case, a $4 trillion tax cut. Based on past estimates from the Joint Committee on Taxation, even if you repeal all itemized deductions, most above the line deductions, all personal exemptions, and all individual tax credits, you still wouldn't be able to finance these tax cuts. And you would, in my opinion, wallop lower and middle income families with a very big tax increase. Now, tell me how you plan to pay for these absolutely enormous tax cuts 
and how you would avoid hitting the middle class. And uh, I've heard you before um, uh, toss this football over to the Ways and Means Committee, so don't do that. Just tell me how you're going to pay for it. Okay, so the Ways and Means Committee, <laughs> um, a couple of things. Uh, that assumption in our budget, I know there I go with that word again, that comes from the Ways and Means Committee. They gave us, our budget shows the letter from the Ways and Means Committee that said, please in include instructions to the committee to do revenue neutral tax reform with the goal toward achieving um, lower rates, broader base, with the goal of having a top rate of 25%. Okay, why do we do that? What a lot of folks don't realize is eight out of 10 businesses in America, they're not corporations. They're what we call pass-through entities. They pay their taxes as individuals, subchapter S corporations, mm -hmm. LLCs, partnerships, meaning they pay the individual income tax rate. And the international tax average of businesses in the industrialized world is 25%. So our big corporations um, have a 35% rate. That's and the some highest. Of them don't pay any. Some of them don't pay any because of loopholes. Some of them pay 35%. Some of them pay zero. GE paid zero last year because of loopholes in the tax code. But the top small businesses now pay effectively about 44.8% top marginal income tax rate when their competitors are paying 25% or less. I come from Wisconsin. Our biggest competitors internationally are Canadians. Mm -hmm. Overseas to us means Lake Superior. <laughs> and the Canadians tax all of their businesses at 15% now. Nine out of our 10 businesses aren't corporations. They're, they're pass-throughs. They pay as individuals. So we're giving our successful small businesses, you know, the ones that have 100, 200 employees, I understand a 44% tax, tax rate to compete against Canada with a 15% tax rate? Let me just take back. So what we're saying, LC, is yeah. lower those tax rates to create jobs, to be more competitive. It's not just some rich guy. It's, it's, it's businesses, but how do job you, creators. how do you pay for that for And the TPC hold. analysis assumed something we don't assume that we don't do any base broadening, that we don't plug any loopholes, and therefore it just costs all this money. Well, I don't know about all the things that you could do and you still wouldn't make it up. No, no, our whole premise is to broaden the base and lower the rates. And the point I would simply make is we got $10 trillion over the next 10 years of loopholes, of tax expenditures. Pick half of those. I'm just doing, I'm roughing it out. And you're there. So the point is there are plenty of tax expenditures. And look at who gets them. It's the wealthiest among us who use the tax expenditures. Disproportionately higher income individuals and sophisticated corporations use the tax expenditures, the loopholes in the tax code. And so what happens is, if they park their money in a tax shelter, they are sheltering their income from taxation. And everybody else has to pay a higher tax rate as a result to, to raise a certain amount of revenue. If we take away their tax shelter and subject more of their income to taxation, we can lower tax rates across the board for everybody. The theory we're applying here is whatever kind of income you make, at whatever level, you ought to pay the same tax rate as the next guy who makes the same amount. That would really be nice. And I'm like Mr. Bishop. You know, I live paycheck to paycheck. And I'm not faulting anybody. He and I are always categorized as two of the poorest people in Congress. I accept that. I don't have any problem with it. Would the gentleman yield? Yeah, but I know. Would you, you please say least? Poor. Would least. you please say least okay, wealthy? Least, least wealthy. Thank you. Uh, because I do think I'm pretty well off. And I paid $43,000 in income taxes last year. Uh, I paid 38000 the year before that. And I would not mind paying more taxes if I thought that it was going to help children go to school, if I thought that it was going to provide more research and at NIH and all of the things that are vitally necessary um, uh, for that, which brings me to infrastructure. How in the world can you ignore any spending in infrastructure in your tax proposal and expect to get growth? I just, I have a problem understanding that. And it, and it goes double coming from a state like mine. Uh, John Micah and Corinne Brown, along with Democrats and Republicans, fought for seven years to get $1.8 billion, $1.7 billion in the budget for transportation in the state of Florida for light rail. My existing governor, now governor, um, cut that program, bam, coal. And that money went to Illinois, Connecticut, California, and it created jobs. And when I hear you, um, and, and, and I hear everybody here, 
ignore the, the we come at it from the standpoint of oh how bad the bridges are how how bumpy the roads are how how many airports we need but it would create jobs everybody said that that 1.8 billion dollars would create 18,000 jobs nobody refuted it and you ignore spending on infrastructure in your budget no we have the transportation trust fund how much fund. oh the whatever trust the revenue is fund. yeah that's the place. As you know, transportation is fee financed by gas taxes. Yeah, and after the highway bill expires, gas tax and other trust fund revenues will be insufficient, in my judgment, to fund the projected that's spending. True. That's true. Okay, so, you know, sometimes we hide behind our tax law and our current law, and sometimes well, saying, we don't. We, we don't ignore transportation funding. It's in our budget. I, I understand. Well, well, it's sort of like a passing reference. It's sort of like the two companies you <laughs> identify in your budget um, on solar and uh, that kind of exploration. It turns out that those two were profitable. Solyndra certainly was a disaster. Uh, but uh, about to not believe that we should be about the business of exploring uh, in the green energy area, we're going to have uh, uh, other countries, China lead among them, eat our lunch in, in that arena. And it's uh, very troubling. I have one final thing, and I can't um, uh, 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 so many more. I wanted to talk about student loan uh, 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 funding, but I want you to understand, and I want everybody in Congress and America to understand that the Medicaid program is just as important as the Medicare program. Medicare, generally speaking, we already have Medicare, and we have advantage programs for those who can take care of themselves and can get more. And what we found with Medicare Advantage is insurance companies are very, very ingenious at creating cherry picking and taking the sick. And I can give you countless examples of people that I know personally that live in Century Village and Kings Point that experienced um, uh, difficulties with Medicare Advantage once they learned that they weren't going to receive everything that they needed. But how can you explain that it would be possible for states to find savings of the magnitude 8% you say in 2015, a third by 2023, if I read your uh, budget uh, correctly, without reducing eligibility of vital health benefits. And just list me a number of the efficiencies. And let me tell you what the problem with that is. And let's just be political, point blank about it. Some governors would do all of the things that you and I would want them to do, and some won't. And we have seen this movie in Florida on Medicaid where the money was misdirected. And I just simply don't understand how you can a uh, list of uh, 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 that that won't be a reduction in eligibility of vital health benefits in Medicaid, and I tell you that is a serious sticking point for this member and a whole lot of members here in Congress. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Mr. Chairman, I I have other questions, but I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I just wanted to thank you uh, uh, both for making your staffs uh, so uh, available as this uh, goes on, doing the RSC budget, doing the uh, the CBC uh, budget, it matters to have the experts uh, available uh, to be called on. I, I very much appreciate that. Um, when you listen to my colleague from Florida talk about the most humane uh, budget being offered uh, is one that raises federal taxes uh, to levels never before seen in this country and keeps them there in perpetuity, uh, it's coming from the heart. He genuinely believes that if we take more from folks and, and spend it from Washington, we'll create a better, a better country. That's how broad the divides are here, and, and you all in both of your capacities have always come and said, you know what, even though these are very serious matters, they're not talking points, they're not for the Sunday morning programs, they're serious questions about how we're going to conduct business in America, how we're going to uh, fulfill the American dream. Uh, you've always said, you know what, let's bring all the budgets, let's bring all the ideas, uh, let's, let's have it out. Uh, we don't need to close this debate, we need to open up this debate, and that's going to move this country closer in the right direction. Uh, wherever it is the American people choose. I just appreciate uh, uh, that about uh, you both. I enjoy serving uh, with you on the committee. It's not a place where I uh, try to run from because I think it's going to make me angry. It's a place I try to run to uh, because I think it's going to educate me and make me better. Uh, and I thank you both for that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fulton. Ms. Poles. The chair of the plans for the committee, uh, both before and after votes. Uh, we, uh, we're wanting to finish this panel in the yeah. next uh, five or six or seven minutes. And then we will return uh, at the end of votes, and we will entertain uh, a number of other of our colleagues uh, 
uh, who are here. Uh, I see Mr. Scott over there, so we'll return. So I would anticipate we'll be here until probably 7.30 or 8 o'clock tonight. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I'll just try to keep mine to three or four minutes. And my first question is for Mr. Ryan. Um, why, maybe you can explain to me economically why it is imperative or even desirable to balance the budget. Why not have a deficit such that, that uh, the debt as a percentage of GDP shrinks every year? For instance, a $50 billion year sure. deficit and just use that $50 billion to further reduce taxes. Why take it yeah. from people in the first place if you can have a deficit at that level and still allow debt to shrink? Because deficit's already too high. The debt, the debt is already too high. So well, wouldn't the debt go down so, if we had so as a percentage of GDP if, if we had, say, right, $50 billion year right, deficit? So I think some of the estimates of primary balance at 3%. Um, if your economy is not growing at 3%, you're still increasing your debt, number one. Number two, we believe by locking in uh, not only at balancing the budget but hitting surpluses and paying off the debt more rapidly by putting these, these long-term reforms in law today will give us an added benefit of certainty for the markets. It will help stabilize interest rates. It will help stabilize the value of our currency going forward. It will help unlock uncertainty in the business sector so we can have faster economic growth. And we also believe since the debt is already too high, gross debt is above 100% of GDP, we need to rapidly drop yeah. our debt levels down so that if we would have a crisis, if we have some exogenous shock coming from Europe, we have some kind of a foreign policy crisis, sure. we don't have much of a cushion to borrow right now. We want to go and get that we cushion. My time and just, just, I would allow the full answer, but I'm going to try to finish in three minutes. So I want to have a little bit of a dialogue with you. Otherwise, I'd be happy to. <laughs> um, but but um, again, I think what, what the markets look at, economists look at, is not amount of debt, because amount of debt for a little country like Portugal is going to be very different than the United States. It's debt as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and I think that the key indicator would be a decrease in that. Now, now clearly, there's different levels of a decrease. You could have a very large surplus, and that would decrease very quickly. You could also have a modest deficit, and it would continue to decrease as well. So, uh, it, uh, you know, just it's, it seems like you can you can meet that goal that you articulated very well of reassuring the global marketplace, uh, reducing the debt as a percentage of GDP, et cetera, and have a nominal deficit of some amount in some years. And uh, is that something that you see as is? is inherently undesirable or something that you would be open to if, if that uh, uh, money was used appropriately to bring down yeah, taxes? Perhaps that's where this compromise will end up going at the end of the day. Uh, at least the Senate's passing a budget, so we have a vehicle to move uh, a compromise. Uh, we see our goal in trying to get a down payment on the problem. Our so, budget fixes the problem, but we understand that we're the minority power here. So hopefully we can get a good down payment. Uh, second question, and then I'll go to my final statement, is uh, with regard to how the budget interplays with policy. And I want to make sure I, I understand this right because it's very complicated. So we have, for instance, something that was in Obamacare like the medical device tax. It's my understanding you keep the revenue from those taxes. Now, you may have a lot decided to tax something else, but you keep those revenues right. abolish the spending. Is that correct? So, so that revenue has been in the baseline for about three years now. And the revenue baseline given us to by CBO hits revenues as a percentage of GDP. And what we say is we need to have a tax code that replaces a commensurate amount of revenues as a percentage of GDP. Those are in that. In the baseline. So, so, with that, so to, to see how that intersects with policy, for instance, last session uh, there was a bill that repealed the medical device tax and it, it cut spending from Obamacare to do that. Uh, if, if I, is, am I correct that under this budget, the offset couldn't be cut in spending under Obamacare because that is in your new baseline. Yeah. You'd actually have to find other, other taxes to raise if you wanted to get rid of that medical device tax. Yeah, and then I'll go to Mr. Van Hollen on that. We're funding this bill to accommodate those kinds Mr. of Mr. Van Hollen? Mr. Paulus, uh, you know, both your questions, I think, have been right on target. Uh, first, with respect to the, you know, what the, what the objective is from the perspective of the economy, the first thing you want to do is obviously make sure your deficits are not growing faster than the economy uh, and you stabilize the debt-to-GDP ratio. On this point, look, they, they assume uh, the $1 trillion uh, in their budget uh, from the Affordable Care Act until further notice is how are they going to replace that exact $1 trillion. Let me put it this way. If we did this year what uh, our colleagues wanted to do last year, I think it was, where H.R. 1 was repealing all of Obamacare, this budget would immediately be out of balance. I mean, unless in some theoretical way, maybe not, because they're going to come up with a trillion dollars, they're not going to tell anybody where it's from. 
but it'd be out of balance because embedded in here is a trillion dollars from Obamacare. So effectively, the majority of the House can no longer repeal Obamacare in its entirety, including the taxes, without throwing this budget into disarray. Is that what you're saying? I mean, exactly. If we were to repeal Obamacare today, which is what our Republican colleagues would want to do, the Ways and Means Committee would have to immediately find another trillion dollars, which they give us no idea where they're going to get. So remember, it was 10 years of pay-fors to pay for six years of spending when Obamacare passed. We're a little farther down that 10-year window, but there are some imbalances with respect to what pays for Obamacare and the spending of Obamacare. That's not even to get into the estimates of the competitive dumping that will occur of people going to the Obamacare exchange. I realize we have a vote, but we can debate this whole time. Well, Mr. Parr, I do think it's important. It's outside the story. I get it. Sure. In the year 2023, when they say they get the balance, about $400 billion in that year in their budget comes from Obamacare. So I want to thank you. You know, I have some degree of frustration with this process. I'm sure even the participants do. You know, what's frustrating me is we have a good work product from both Mr. Van Hollen and Mr. Ryan who worked very hard. The other remaining work products that are offered are actually further out from those two. They're further out. What I would like to see, and I think America would like to see, is kind of something in between where the two of your work product is. Frankly, I think it has some but not all the revenues from Mr. Van Hollen's, some but not all the entitlement reforms from Mr. Ryan's. You know, I wish that there was that opportunity in the past. I've supported the Bull Simpson budget on the floor of the House. I realize nobody offered it as an amendment this year. I would just hope that there's a way that the two of you could work together to come up with something that could actually stand for support from the American people from across the spectrum, and especially what I believe to be the majority of Americans, which are probably somewhere in the middle. And with that, I'll go back. Mr. Nugent, very quickly, the question is always about the debt. And we haven't heard a lot of talk about our interest payment on the debt. And we're at historically low interest rates, right? 1.67%. You know, most people can live with some level of debt. I live with debt. I have a house payment, car payment. So we all can live with some level of debt. But when you have 1.6%, it's kind of like having a variable rate interest mortgage. I had one when I first got married. Had it for two or three years and then figured we couldn't afford that first hit that we took. What are we spending today just on interest payments alone? Just right about $200. What do we expect our interest payment to be next year in this upcoming budget? Well, we just use, both of us use the CBO baseline. So we use whatever CBO claims they think interest payments will be, which is based upon what they think the debt will be, which is based upon what they think interest rates will be. Problem is, if any of those assumptions go off, it throws everybody way off. Kind of like what Mr. <clears throat> my good friend L.C. Hastings mm -hmm. said about assumptions, and particularly on the interest rate, because what control do we have over that? Well, Ben Bernanke might give you a different answer than I will, but um, uh, right now they're extremely low because of the Fed's intervention. Um, when they pop, meaning go up, our, our, the spending on interest payments dramatically increases. I've asked runs for CBO to give us different interest rate simulations, average of the 80s, average of the 90s, the blue chip consensus forecast, and the average additional costs over a 10-year window range from 1.4 to $5.4 trillion in additional interest payments alone. I'm waiting for a new run from CBO on these numbers, and my guess is they'll be just as ugly. How do we pay that if that were the case? If it just went up to the, the historical average, how would we pay for that interest payment? Oh, okay. I have. A, I we actually we just got these numbers today. Um, it goes up 1.4 trillion to as much as 6.3 trillion dollars. Uh, so various interest rate scenarios that they have run. So how the problem is, we lose control of our fiscal situation. If we have it, this is what we talk about a debt crisis. We literally lose control of our fiscal situation because you have to pay your interest. You can't default. Right. And the problem is, it crowds out everything else. And you have to cut in all these other areas to get your debt under control, to try and stabilize your interest rates. And you're, you're past the moment where you can control your own country's economic and fiscal fate. That's why we want to get ahead of this problem in the first place. Well, I appreciate, <clears throat> I appreciate both of you 
it's always, always interesting to hear both your perspectives. End of the day, end of the day, we know that we have, and everybody wants to kind of poo-poo this idea that we have this debt out here that is going to crush us once the interest rates go up. And we know that even Bernanke is saying, I believe 2015 is the last thing I've heard that they believe interest rates will go up by 2015. Yeah, it's the CBO. I think their projections, they start normalizing rates in 2015. Um, it, it's interesting if you look at the baseline, well, we got to get going, I know, but in 2019, they, it starts cl clipping up too. The deficit does, and that's partly because of normalization of interest rates. Well, I appreciate both of you. Thank you very much. Mr. Webster. How are we doing? Okay. I just had a couple of questions real quick, Mr. Chairman. First of Chairman Ryan. Uh, uh, just so we know, there are about 200 that have not voted. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just... Okay. My question is, it looks like if we don't make a decision, then that decision is going to be made by time. So we could we could go on and continue the way we have, but but or uh, and not make a decision, and somebody else will make it for us, or some thing will make it for us, and that's time. So I, I read a. Uh, it was a kind of an interesting recipe of how to cook rabbit over the weekend. And the, there was a priority. And the first priority, number one, first step is catch the rabbit. So it looks to me like a balanced budget is catching the rabbit. Do you, did your budget catch the rabbit? Yes. And as a kid who's been rabbit hunting since I was about 10 years old, getting rabbits from my German grandmother who made Hassan Pfeffer with it, um, I would completely agree with you. You, you, you got to catch the rabbit first if you're going to have Haas and Pfeffer. You got to balance the budget first if you're going to get this debt under control and have a healthy economy. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, you uh, Mrs. Ross Lighton. Very, very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, on behalf of the committee, I want to thank both of you for uh, taking time to be here. We uh, promised uh, that we would finish about now, and we did, so the gentleman, this panel is excused. Uh, I'd like to announce to the Rules Committee that, uh, and anyone else that's in here, that we're going to go and take our three votes, and at the end of the uh, third vote, we'll uh, reconvene. <laughs> Three will be in recess.
Committee will be in order. The, uh, I thank the um, panel members who have come back. Uh, thank Mr. Scott and Mr. Mulvaney for uh, allowing us to get through the vote schedule. And uh, at this time, we will uh, move further on to uh, our panel, the uh, gentleman, uh, Mick Mulvaney, who is from the uh, Small Business Committee, and uh, Mr. Scott as representing the uh, CBC. And uh, Mr. Scott, welcome. Uh, it, obviously, uh, we'll accept any written statement that you have uh, and enter that into the record without objection. Uh, that will be done, and we're delighted that you're here. Gentlemen, Mr. Scott's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is on behalf of myself and the chair of the Black Caucus, Congresswoman Fudge from Ohio. Uh, the Simpson Bowles Commission set a $4 trillion goal, 10 year deficit reduction goal. The CBC accepts that goal, but not necessarily the specific recommendations. Uh, based on an analysis by the Center for American Progress, we've already done about $2.4 trillion. Uh, working off the CBO's February current law baseline and considering the deficit reduction goal, the CBC budget calls for revenue enhancements of $2.7 trillion over the next 10 years. We outline about $4.2 trillion in revenue options um, in, um, uh, in, 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 our, in our documents. We know those are unpopular, but also unpopular, the sequester and the Medicare and, and health care co uh, cuts in the uh, committee budget. The revenue enhancements will be used to cancel the sequester, pay for a half trillion dollar jobs bill that will put five million Americans back to work, and provide for an additional 2.8 trillion, 2.8 billion in long-term investments, education, job training, health care, and research. Even with these investments, our budget is expected to reduce the deficit by approximately 2.8 trillion dollars. Um, and uh, this is the CBO scoring. We believe we'll do much better than that because of the jobs, um, the effect of, of the jobs bill on the economy. But uh, CBO scoring doesn't allow that. That's fine. But uh, just point out that uh, we're going to do numbers would actually be better. Um, you've heard the debate on the um, uh, committee budget, so I'll just uh, submit the sta my statement, the rest of my statement to the record. I uh, thank the gentleman very much. Uh, gentleman, Mr. Mulvaney is recognized. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, last year I offered the, the President's budget as an attempt to force a discussion about a bunch of different things, uh, not the least of which was a discussion about uh, the merits of a budget that never balanced. I thought it was important to have that discussion. Um, and uh, regardless of what else it achieved, I think we at least had the debate last year about the President's budget. I wanted to do that again. This year, I wanted to bring the President's budget before us and have a similar debate. Uh, but then, of course, the President went and did something extraordinarily stunning. For the first time since 1921, he became the first President not to offer a budget. Um, I was amazed at that, uh, especially after some of the things the President um, had said. He said recently, for example, that uh, uh, we cannot sustain a system that bleeds billions of taxpayer dollars on programs that have outlived their usefulness or exist solely because of the power of politicians, lobbyists, or interest groups. We simply cannot afford it. We will go through our federal budget page by page, line by line, eliminating those programs we don't need. He also went on to say later that uh, he said the debate over budgets and deficits is about more than just numbers on a page. It's about more than just cutting and spending. It's about the kind of future that we want. It's about the kind of country that we believe in. And indeed, the budget really is two things. It is a spending document, but it's all, also a, a vision document. And for the President not to offer a budget and not to offer that, that vision, especially in light of the things that he said, um, was amazing to me. What was more stunning, Mr. Chairman, was what he did despite what the law says. The law requires him to do this. The law requires him to offer a budget. In fact, I think he's the first President ever to be late three different times, in addition to being the first President never to offer a budget. That's just wrong. Mr. McGovern, you were talking earlier about uh, a bipartisan nature. I, I hope that at the very least we could be bipartisan in agreeing that the President of the United States should follow the law. Uh, and I know that you don't know me very well. I know several folks uh, from your side of the aisle that I've worked with, they do know me. Rest assured, many folks on this side of the aisle do know me. And I can tell you, sir, if this was a Republican President who had failed to deliver a budget, I would be here. In fact, I would give you my word that if I stay long enough to, to see a president of my own party in the White House again and he fails to deliver a budget, I will be the first person to do this. 
This is wrong for the president to ignore the law. And I would hope that the, this committee would give us the chance, Republican and Democrat alike, to send the message to the president, regardless of his or her party, that they have to follow the law. And for that, I would hope that the First Amendment would be ruled in order. Uh, the second amendment, Mr. Chairman, is fairly simple. It is the Senate uh, 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 Budget Committee um, draft that passed out of committee last, uh, last week, with the exception of some very, very technical language in the last section, Section 501. It is exactly the document that passed out of the Senate Committee uh, just a couple days ago. Uh, during the discussion last year about the President's budget, uh, there were some criticisms uh, lodged against my proposal that said it wasn't exactly what the President had offered. This is word for word. Uh, what the Senate Democrats have suggested. There are several things, I think, that are, that are noteworthy in that budget. Uh, it raises taxes by at least $900 billion. I'd be curious to know what the House thinks about that. In fact, if you take them at their word on how they're going to replace the sequester and how they're going to add additional stimulus money in what they call a deficit-neutral manner, it's actually a $1.5 trillion tax increase coming out of the Senate uh, Democrats. It increases spending by $265 billion. Spending grows uh, four and a half, uh, per, more than 4.5 percent per year. Uh, it still has a $566 billion deficit in the same year that the Republican proposal is in surplus. And I, was, I have suggested before, I would suggest again, that any budget that never balances is no budget. Any budget that never balances means that you never intend to pay the money back. You cannot pay the money back until you have a surplus. And if you never have a surplus, you could never pay the money back. And I would suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, that if I come to you and I ask you to give me money and I have the intention to pay it back to you, that is debt. But if I come to you and I ask you to give me money and I no have no intention of ever giving it back to you, that is theft. And there's an important distinction between what uh, the Republicans are offering and what the Senate uh, Democrats are offering. Um, in addition, the uh, Senate budget, I think, cuts defense by an additional quarter trillion dollars on top of the uh, reductions that we've already seen. Those of you who know my brief here, time here know that uh, I have been willing to look at the Defense Department for possible savings, but I think that to uh, cut an additional quarter trillion dollars out of the Defense Department was a very interesting proposal by the Senate Democrats, and I think it deserves a vote on the, House, the floor of the House. Uh, with that, I'll uh, yield my time and be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Mulvaney, it's my recollection that you last time presented the President's budget. Do you have any idea when the president is going to, has the president stated when he would bring his budget to the uh, American people in the House? We've been told by his uh, spokesperson it would be April 8th, and I think the president in our meeting with him the other day confirmed that. So around April the 8th. April 8th, well after our vote, well after the Senate is vote, well after the law requires. Is there any speculation as to why? Is, is he trying to make himself irrelevant? I think Mr. Carney said, and again, I, I don't mean to put words in the President's mouth, so I have to use the, the words of his spokesman, was that there were so many impediments to doing a budget in large part because of the fiscal cliff and the sequester that they simply didn't have time to put it together. Mr. Scott, you had time to put a budget together. That, is that a question? <laughs> That's a statement. I want to thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Bishop. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, no, I just, just for the historical record, I should point out, because I know my chairman's a big fan of Ronald Reagan, that he submitted his budget uh, 45 days late, and I guess everybody's forgotten about that. And he had, how, how many times was that? Well, I, I, at least I know one. I, 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 one I'm referring to it, but, but, you know, so I mean, you it's not that presidents haven't ever done that before. I do think the president should submit a budget, um, and I expect that he will, um, and I think that it, it probably would be easier for them to do so if uh, we hadn't been through a fiscal cliff and a whole bunch of other uncertainties here that have made it very difficult to actually predict what's, what, 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 what really is going to happen. And I also noticed that, uh, that uh, my colleague has offered the Senate budget as a substitute. And I, I guess I'm, I, 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 mean, I, I mean, do you think it, it's constructive and responsible uh, in regular order uh, for the House to vote on the Senate budget before the Senate has a chance to even debate it? Well, sure. I think, I think the history, from what little I I've, I've know from being here a brief period of time, is that um, anybody who offers a, a budget that meets the, the various rules is allowed to do it. It's one of our, our, our great institutions I, I, offering I, I an know, open we rule. We can do anything you want here. Right. I'm just, I'm, we, we can do anything you want, we want here. I'm just, I guess, again, going back to this, what I had tried to make, the point I tried to make is that um, I kind of feel like, notwithstanding an election, 
uh, where I think the people spoke pretty loudly. Um, we seem to be farther apart this year than we were last year. And, uh, and yes, the President is late submitting his budget, and that, I think it's perfectly okay. He's 42 days late. Reagan was 45 days late. But, you know, to make any difference, um, you got to submit a budget. And, um, and I, think, but I think there are reasons for him not to do so. But in terms of the Senate budget, the Senate is working on, a, I mean, a, a, a budget which hasn't even been debated and amended and voted on by the senators. And I, I know you can bring it here, but I just, in the spirit of trying to, you know, kind of bring the parties together, um, I, I just, I'm just not quite sure. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to you having the right to bring that to the floor. Sure. I just question whether or not it's going to accomplish anything other than trying to, you know, well, make some political points. And I, and, I, and I think there's enough political points to be made on the budgets that are already being offered. That's, that's my only point. I think it's a fair question, Mr. McGovern, but I think you have to admit that uh, we don't often get a chance to vote on things that the Senate takes up. First of all, they're likely not to take it up. I doubt that they have 60 votes to even begin debate on this. Um, but I do think it's, it, there's, there's value to at least letting the House check in on a possible Senate offering, um, just as it is uh, it, important for the House to check in on Mr. Van Hollen's budget. The two are, are similar in ways and, and dissimilar in ways. Uh, the Senate actually spends less money than Mr. Van Hollen does. It raises taxes uh, by less, but it has a larger deficit um, and cuts defense more. I think those variables are important as we look at this as a vision doc. Where does the House stand on as many different options as possible? I think there's a value to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, 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 you, you see more of a value than I do. And I, and I think that, um, you know, again, that, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of different alternatives. To debate uh, on, on the floor, and um, and I would say, you know the, um, you know Mr. Ryan, I, I have strong disagreements with his, with his budget, and and, so, and some of the conservatives are bringing a budget. I have strong disagreements with that, but I think it's still legitimate points of view, and they ought to be debated on the floor. I just think we're now getting into the area of political gimmickry, where I where I do, um, I do regret that, uh, well, I, I, where I do conclude that it, it, it doesn't add anything other than trying to score some political points. But I, I get it. I'm not, I'm not objecting to it being made in order if that's what you want to do. Um, and, um, and, uh, and I would say to my friend, Mr. Scott, I think you guys put together a, a, a responsible budget. Look forward to supporting it. It's very different from what has been presented by uh, some of the others here. But um, I think it's a, a more realistic step in the right direction. And um, thank you for bringing it here. I look forward to supporting it. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to commend both of you as well. I, I actually think these debates are exceptionally helpful. Uh, and frankly, just going through the process of putting together budget, I'm going to differ a little bit with my good friends from Massachusetts. I particularly what, uh, <coughs> appreciate what you're doing, Mr. Mulvaney, because I think the President's budget, you know, if we could get it there, would deserve a vote. I think the Senate's does. Uh, one of the more interesting things to me in the Ryan budget Last year, it's no big surprise that the majority party could pass its budget through this chamber. But it was the only budget that had significant support in both chambers. And it was introduced uh, in the Senate, as I recall, it got 42 votes. Now, that's not 51, that's not a majority, but it got more votes than the Democratic alternative <laughs> budget uh, uh, did, uh, or the President's budget, which got none in either chamber. And I think my, when my friend talks about political gimmicks, I think when you put together a budget that nobody in your own party will support, not a single vote, that's a political gimmick to me. Well, the um, yield for I certainly yield to my friend. Yeah, no, I'm just look, I'm looking at the amendment uh, right. that uh, Mr. Mulvaney has offered, the, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess the President's budget, which is a uh, bunch of question marks. Um, you know, it's one thing if the President has submitted a budget, you know, that we could actually debate. It's another thing when, when it's this. I'm, I, I get it. You know, this is a very political place. It's becoming more political by the day. But I just think that, you know, I, I'm not sure it's constructive. That's well, all. And I think that's a fair point, although I think, again, when the president routinely said this was not, a, you know, a one-time deal. He's been late every year. And when I see members able to assemble budgets uh, with exactly the same information, a lot less staff than the president of the United States has, uh, and these budgets are going to go to the floor and be voted on. They're going to be Democrat. They're going to be Republican. They're going to represent a variety of points of view in the Congress across the political spectrum. Somehow they've gotten it together and they can get it down here. I think the president should, too. And I think that's a point worth making. Uh, if you want to be serious, be serious. And, again, we were able to get, I don't know what it would be this year, but uh, 42 of our members 
on the in the other rotunda to vote for the Ryan budget uh, uh, last time. Not all of them did, but 42 is a pretty big number. It would be interesting to me how many Democratic votes that the Senate budget gets in this chamber. So, again, I, I understand the point, but I think that the, the discussion is a good one and a healthy one. Uh, I wish the President's budget had arrived here in a more timely manner so we could we could have that vote. But I think it is worth noting that it hasn't, and that shouldn't be lost in the debate, and there ought to be an opportunity to discuss that on the floor. Uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I uh, would point out to uh, uh, my uh, friend from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney, uh, that uh, while it's perhaps relevant to point out uh, uh, that as you put it, the Senate may not have 60 votes. I, um, I don't know about you, but I tire of um, either side being in the minority and their continuous uh, obstruction of uh, measures. And that's why they can't get 60 votes is because the Republicans maintain uh, their uh, obstruction. That's not yours or uh, my prerogative over there on that side. Uh, but. Clearly, to be partisan for a moment, Mr. McConnell made it very clear what his objective is, and I don't think he has veered off from that, and that's his prerogative. I disagree with it. I think their rules are arcane and, in some respects, a bit undemocratic, and I just wish that that were not the case. I stand by my position. My friend from Georgia uh, pointed out um, uh, that the other budgets, uh, particularly the Ryan budget that contemplates, I don't know how he figures, uh, cutting rich folks or taxes from 39 to 25 percent is humane, uh, but I gather that he's talking about 10 years down the road if everything went according to Hoyle uh, to introduce uh, yet another term of uh, 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 gambling art, uh, which it does not and will not. Uh, so I stand by my position uh, that Mr. Scott, Ms. Fudges, um, and Ms. Moore of Wisconsin and Ms. Lee of California uh, as well as almost all of us in the Congressional Black Caucus budget, deals with what I think are things uh, that government ought to uh, be about. And most of us, I know, as well as the progressives, um, uh, when we start our days around here, we start trying to worry about the most vulnerable in our society and not those that are the wealthiest. So I stand by my budget. Uh, uh, comment uh, that the Black Caucus budget is uh, the more humane as opposed to the Ryan budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I say to my friend from Florida, I agree with him. When you talk about uh, lowering rates from 39 percent to 25 percent, it sounds like you're trying to give your, your rich friends a break. Uh, but what we all know, and to Mr. Polis's point earlier about trying to find that middle ground that we can work towards together, what we all know is that folks don't pay 39 percent, that if you're one of the rich folks who are in that bracket to begin with, that you also can afford the lawyers and the accountants and the attorneys to, to be happy to yield. Well, I, I, I would tell my friend because <laughs> the same lawyers, those same accountants. Because you and I will take the loopholes out of the system. You know, when Teresa Hines Carey had to release her tax return when John Kerry was running for president, she made six point one million dollars and paid about an eleven percent effective tax rate and virtually nothing into Social Security and Medicare. Now she did it by following all the laws that members of this body uh, have passed for years and years, and I don't fault her for that. But it has to be said that when you make $6.1 million, you probably qualify as one of those rich folks that you're talking about. And what Mr. Ryan is talking about is changing the tax rules of the game so that she no longer pays an 11.1% effective rate, even though she's in a 39% marginal bracket, that we bring those folks, uh, those folks up. And I, I think that is one of those areas that, that we can agree on. I think we are... It's a shame that we don't have the president's budget. I don't mean that in a, in a political sense. I mean, I think we would have taken some ideas in the budget committee. I think you and I served on the budget committee together uh, last uh, term. I think about all the hearings that we had with the Federal Reserve chairman and the Treasury secretary and the OMB director where we're really going through line by line some of the ideas that the president had, uh, many of which we would not agree with, but some of which we would agree with, and we were able to bring those together into a, a package in the middle. You tell me, Mr. Mulvaney, it appears that your package may be the package in the middle. You tax less than the Van Hollen substitute. You spend less 
than the Van Hollen substitute, uh, you may be offering the middle ground that uh, Mr. Polis was talking about earlier. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's an interesting alternative that the Senate Democrats have come up with. And I believe, it, I recognize uh, it's easy to dismiss this as politics, but this is, this is the this is a committee of the United States Senate that's passed this out. I, uh, Mr. McGovern, I'm sure your, your colleagues across the building wouldn't consider them themselves to be legitimate. I mean, this is a valid group of people. It's an important thing that they've accomplished, actually getting a budget out, at least out of committee for the first time in four years, and I think it does merit a discussion. There's a, for example, um, uh, they, they cut defense by more than Mr. Van Hollen does. Um, and cut it by more than Mr. Ryan does. Where's the sweet spot in there? Is it, is, it, is it here where Mr. Ryan is? Is it here where Mr. Van Hollen is? Or is it here where the Senate Democrats is? I think that's, that, that is a valid conversation to have. It's not a made-up number. These are not numbers that we just sat around in my office and, and came up with on our own. It's not the Mulvaney budget. This is the Senate Democrats offering, and I think it at least merits the discussion. Mr. Scott, let me ask you, I, I'm offering an alternative uh, as well on behalf of the Republican Study Committee. It, we're going to come to balance in about four years with a mixture of tax reform and spending reductions. Uh, we actually lower taxes because we do away with the, the President's fiscal cliff tax uh, increase. Most of us voted against it. We didn't think it was uh, that we wanted to include that in our budget. Uh, but you raise taxes in your budget uh, by $4.2 trillion over a decade, according to the notes is, I have. Is that, an, is that an accurate figure? Am I, am I getting bad information? Um, no, we give $4.2 trillion in possibilities. We, the instructions to the Ways and Means Committee at $2.7 trillion. Okay. Out of, and, and we have $4.2 trillion in possibilities. It makes this the $4.2 in possibilities, and it doesn't include some of the suggestions in the President's budget, the 28 percent, or any other way of raising money. But it does show that 2.7 is a realistic number. Well, in, in my substitute, we lower the we lower the revenue baseline and, and balance in four. Uh, the Budget Committee's mark uh, keeps the same revenue baseline we have currently, but balances in 10. Uh, you raise that revenue baseline by $2.7 trillion. When does the CBC budget come to balance? We, um, pursuant to the Simpson-Bowles directive, we get the budget under control so that the debt is growing no faster than inflation, so that things are not getting worse. I'll tell you that because we have a half trillion dollar jobs bill in here, it will do a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, President Clinton's budget in 93 uh, was never projected to come into balance, but we had so much investment in education and transportation and jobs, 20 million jobs created. When you created those jobs, we went into, um, into surplus because of the stimulus effect. CBO does not allow you to score that. That's fine. Other, if, if they did, then everybody would be making up stuff and would be a ph philosophical document rather than an arithmetic document. So I think it's correct that you cannot score the so-called dynamic scoring. Uh, but these numbers are real. I mean, if you look at the uh, numbers on the, on the um, uh, committee budget, um, $4.6 trillion, a trillion of it is Obamacare repeal, keep the taxes, repeal the benefits, uh, another trillion and a half is other health care. People are going to be just as sick, so if the government isn't paying for it, who's paying for it? And one thing that's not scored is if you repeal Medicare and all these indigent care people go to the hospital, it's going to be cost shifted somewhere. So society is going to be picking it up. So that's two and a half trillion. Then you get another trillion in unspecified mandatory that, I mean, the mandatory isn't that big to begin with. I don't know what you without any clue as to what you're talking about. And then most, 75 percent of the rest is interest on the stuff that's not going to happen. The, These numbers are real. You can see exactly what you have to do, the choices you have to make. As we think about how we try to find that place in the middle, I happen to agree with my friend from Massachusetts that scoring political points is, is, uh, is probably not a worthwhile uh, uh, investment in and of itself. There's, there's plenty of that going on. I, I would say that about characterizing the Budget Committee mark is as uh, people being just as sick and not having access to care. I'll tell you, I have a medical savings account and uh, haven't always had a medical savings account. I used to just go wherever it was that uh, uh, was closest to me. It happens to be the, the hospital right down the, the street. When I had to go in for a CT scan the other day, I now got out my medical savings account uh, information. They told me how much it was going to cost at all of these facilities close by. The, 
hospital I usually go to, it was going to be an $800 uh, exam, and the imaging center about 10 miles away from my home, it was going to be a $250 exam. So I got in my car, I spent $3 in gas, and I, I saved uh, $550 in, uh, in health care costs. I mean, I, I think we ought to be able to agree that our health care system may be the best system in the world, we may have the best technology in the world, but what we don't have is the most skin in the game amongst our, our folks. And I, I just don't want to let that uh, pass as someone who's very proud of the of the Budget Committee's uh, work, uh, we also wake up, as Mr. Hastings does, worried about uh, how it is that folks are going to have upward mobility uh, in this country. Let me ask you that because I, I, I believe uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of uh, Mr. Hastings' heart. He shares it with us regularly up here, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a valuable part of our discussion. You do take taxes up $2.7 trillion. You don't uh, bring that budget uh, to balance. Uh, you do try to restrain the growth of debt, uh, but you restrain it from its already uh, uh, post-World War II high. My concern is when that next crisis comes, I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm absolutely certain it's going to come. I always think the, the poorest among us suffer the most in whatever the crisis is that, that hits the country because the wealthy are able to defend themselves in ways the poor are not. I worry that we have fewer options, fewer arrows in our quiver as a government if we allow our debt to, to, to you're, remain you're, at this you're, historical you're, you're absolutely level. right. That's why um, I voted for the budget in 1993 that President Clinton um, uh, proposed. Not a single vote from the other side of the aisle. That budget put us in a position where 2001, we not only had a surplus, but we were on the way to paying off the entire debt held by the public by five years ago. 2001, we wrecked the budget with tax cuts that couldn't, we could not afford, went to war, didn't pay for it, prescriptive drug benefit, mm -hmm. didn't pay for that either, and now we're back in the ditch. You've got tough decisions to make. And, you can, and, and, and to suggest that I mean, we, could, we could have put a budget together and said, uh, put a little asterisk in there, and unspecified cuts, uh, $16 trillion. Uh, we'll pay off the national debt by the end of the year. How are you going to do it? Well, we don't have to tell you. Well, in the spirit of that, the Republican plan has a five question. Trillion. Then you've been very candid about the tax increases in the CBC budget. We all know that that there are some very tough uh, spending decisions that we have to make. Can you talk to me a little bit about what the reforms were that you made to? I think we would all agree Medicare, for example, is growing at an unsustainable rate. Bankruptcy in 2023, Social Security bankruptcy right beyond that. What kinds of, because it is about the tough decisions, what well, kinds of tough decisions does the CPC make in those two areas? The first decision we made was to take Social Security and Medicare decision out of the budget decision. If you're going to uh, reform Social Security and Medicare, better known as cut Social Security and Medicare, the cuts are to benefit Social Security and Medicare, not have the, this is a little bait and switch going on. Everybody knows, it's just arithmetic, that Social Security and Medicare are not sustainable with their present revenue and spending track. They're not sustainable. And so you get people nodding, yeah, they need to be cut. Okay, good. We can now use the money we just cut to help pay for these tax cuts. No, that's not what we said. If you're going to adjust Social Security and Medicare, it ought to be used for Social Security and Medicare to, uh, to extend the solvency, not to pay... For tax cuts. You're not suggesting that the, that the House Budget Committee's mark is doing that. You're talking historically uh, conversations that might have been had in decades past. The House Budget Committee budget does not uh, cut revenues at all. Uh, it maintains revenues at exactly the same line. Well, that's, there assume, are that's assuming you can come up with $5 trillion in new taxes. You reduce the rate. How much does that cost? $5 trillion? Well, uh, that's, I guess. What? what? Right. Okay, $4 trillion. Then you have a little asterisk, go find $4 trillion. Well, you're, make, you're making my point. Taxes are going to go up, not going to go down, because uh, you've got to find the $4 trillion. Uh, $4 trillion. In your budget. In your budget. In the House Budget Committee budget. Right. Go find $4 trillion. Well, that, you know, I could have said go find $16 trillion. We pay off the national debt by the end of the year. Well, yeah. well I, <laughs> we, that's no budget. We, 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 I, I continue to believe that it's a it's a healthy thing to have lots of budgets on the on the table. I hope it will well, we, we, end up we further, show, we closer exactly to the middle what, than, we exactly than further away do. down the uh, down the road. And I I, I do uh, knowing now firsthand how much uh, uh, effort it takes. Mr. Mulvaney knew last cycle. I didn't know last cycle how much effort it takes to uh, produce a budget of your own. I certainly appreciate uh, 
uh, you leading that effort for the CBC, and look forward to seeing that on the floor uh, tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank Mr. you. Uh, again, I, uh, I want to reference something I think, uh, you know, Mr. Woodall said. I, I, I don't, you know, the, the Senate Democrats' budget, I understand that the work's not done on their budget. This might be a draft of their budget, perhaps. But it's not a budget that is midway between the Ryan budget and the Van Hollen budget. Uh, I think it's a budget that um, has some differences from the Van Hollen budget. As you indicated, uh, it doesn't get rid of the oil and gas loopholes on the revenue side. It cuts defense a little bit more. Um, but it, it does not resemble a uh, Simpson-Bowles budget. Uh, and it does not resemble kind of a common ground budget between the uh, Democratic and Republican budget. It's uh, much more similar to the Van Hollen budget with some differences. It's also my understanding that they're still uh, working on it. So I guess I would ask: This is, is this this is the committee version, but not the and not the floor version. Is that is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, so I mean, I, I guess I would ask: Why not? Uh, why not uh, wait until the Senate has acted if there's such serious interest in this body taking up the Senate budget and then place the budget that they do enact? Uh, to the House floor, which might mean, you know, in, instead of uh, going home for two weeks, doing this next week. Two answers, one practical and one sort of more philosophical. The only chance I get to do it is now. Um, so that's the answer as to why we do it this week as opposed to waiting a couple of weeks, because there is no mechanism for it to come in part of an open rule as, as part of a budget discussion, because we'll be finished um, here in a day or two. But secondly, I think you have to recognize the political realities over there. It's, it's, it, there there's a possibility, probably a likelihood, that it's not going to change where it is now. And there will be no further debate on it, and they won't have the votes to move it forward. So this is the best uh, interpretation of, of the mind of the, of the majority party in the Senate right now. Uh, well, again, they haven't. Are you saying you, you don't think that they'll adopt this budget? Or is that what you said? You don't think they will adopt this budget? Well, again, I guess if they want to get paid, they have to which begs the question whether or not we should have included the president in that bill as well, I suppose. Um, but, uh, again, it, they haven't passed a budget the last four years. Uh, I honestly don't know if they're going to pass this one this year or not. Again, yeah. that's, it's, all, it's all hypothetical. We, we don't have the opportunity. Or change it. Yeah, so, I mean, I would just argue it's, it's again, it's probably a little premature to bring it to this body, um, given this is clearly a draft they're working on. But uh, in any event, uh, you know, there, there still remains um, kind of a lot of huge differences between these budgets um, that we have before us. Uh, and um, I, I just want to make sure people understand the Senate budget is not a compromise in the middle ground between the Van Hollen budget and the Ryan budget. I don't think that's what the Senate Democrats designed it to be. There's elements of the Ryan budget that I think they flat out oppose, like phasing out the Medicare guarantee and uh, a number of others as well. So. Uh, as well as the repeal of the benefits of Obamacare, but keeping all the taxes of Obamacare, which the Ryan budget does. Uh, so I'll just I'll leave it that, and I'll yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Webster, Mrs. Ross Layton, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I actually don't know where the uh, where it came up in the discussion, but somehow re the Republican minority in the Senate was held out as obstructing progress because uh, of a 60-vote threshold. But if I'm correct on a budgetary measure, they don't have – it's not subject to a filibuster, so they only need a 50-vote majority. So the Democrats in the Senate can pass a budget, have been able to pass the budget for the last three years just simply with their own votes, and the Republicans have not been able to obstruct bringing to a, a budget Chairman, to the floor. Could, could I make a comment on that? Yep. As, as I understand, this is not – this isn't – the, the, the budget – uh, the continuing resolution may um, uh, is is one of the things they're they're defeating with the budget. I think you're right. Re reclaiming my time, we're not talking about the continuing resolution. We're talking about the Senate budget. The Senate will have an opportunity to vote on their budget. It cannot be filibustered. Fifty Democrat or fifty-one Democrats in the Senate side can pass their budget. Um, I expect that that will happen, and that we'll be able to have the the broader discussion. You know, it's interesting as reported in the Hill magazine this afternoon. Without re identifying a partisan affiliation, actually the, pro the proposals contained within the, the, the Ryan or the Budget Committee budget are supported by about 55 percent of the population, 32 percent support what is uh, proposed in the Democratic budget. Now, you put partisan labels on that and that uh, excuse it. Uh, nobody trusts Republicans to do anything, but just, it, just advancing the concept 
Do you prefer cutting spending, no tax increases, balancing the budget in 10 years, 55% of the population said we're for that. 45% uh, would, would really favor repeal of the President's Affordable Care Act. Only 32% wanted to see it continue. Again, putting partisan labels on does, does affect that outcome, but I think it's instructive that what uh, really what people want to see is the discipline on the spending side in in this body where the uh, I mean we are the we're the purse strings for the, the legislative branch of the government it's our obligation to do that so I, I thank both the gentlemen for being here I think they both brought uh, very worthwhile points Mr. Mulvaney I'll just ask you when the president was here and talked to us last week he indicated I thought that all of the features of his budget were contained on the on the website. Did, it, did I understand him correctly to say that? Uh, I believe that to be true, yes, sir. It is, it, now, you've constructed his budget with, with some, uh, some empty spaces. I, I will assume that did anyone go to the, uh, the White House website and try to fill in those numbers? We did, and I recognize the fact that Mr. Scott is an unwilling participant in this, but the difficulty we had with it was that all of the, all of the cuts were unspecified. And then to use his words, because I agree with him, that's no budget. There's $100 billion here, $100 billion there of unspecified cuts. It's, it's, we couldn't fashion it into a budget. It is a, it is a nebulous statement of, of spending reductions without any specifics attached to it, and I think, as most folks would agree, that is not a budget. So it was not possible to piece together from what was on the website and put it in a form that would pass as a budget. Obviously, if it were easy to do that, then the President would have no excuse, which goes to the larger point that Mr. McGovern raised earlier was, why have they done this? If we've had time to do it, you would think they have time to do it, which leads to the inevitable conclusion that they're doing it for political reasons as well. Uh, and that's just as unfortunate as some of the things you're worried about. Um, the President could have easily offered a budget uh, and chose not to. I think the gentleman was correct in that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back the time. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, you, Mr. Scott, Mr. Mulvaney, for not only taking your time to be here, but for your presentations that you made on a uh, substitute. And I thank both of you, and you're both dismissed. And thank you very much. The next panel will call up will be uh, Mr. Cavalda, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, and Mr. Ellison. And I recognize that uh, what I believe is that Mr. Ellison and Mr. Cavalda are making uh, an argument on behalf of their substitute. And uh, we, Ms. Jackson Lee, will feel free if you'd like to join this panel also. You may prefer to be on the next panel. I would respect that. Without objection, uh, any statement that you have will be entered into the record. and. I want to thank both of you, all three of you, for taking time to be here. And um, I would uh, go ahead and recognize Ms. Jackson Lee. Unless were you here to offer your support of their budget or to speak? An amendment? Okay. Uh, I, I would go ahead and recognize the gentlewoman. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and, and thank all of. Sorry for my. And thank all the members of the Rules Committee, and uh, with my colleagues being here, I'll be succinct. Other than to initially add that I support and associate myself with the uh, CBC uh, budget and the CPC budget uh, as job-creating budgets that we collectively worked on, and I thank uh, my colleagues for their great leadership uh, and. Uh, their willingness to work. I think it is well known that um, the sequester uh, causes a loss of 750,000 jobs. And the present Republican budget, uh, H. Conrad's 25, does not in any way uh, provide any support for uh, bringing those jobs back. My amendments uh, have to do, in particular, as I associate myself with uh, the Congressional Black Caucus and the CPC main anchor, among many other things, is the creation of jobs, is to highlight the impact on the National Institutes of Health, uh, which is my uh, amendment uh, number six, uh, which uh, deals with drastic cuts in NIH. And I highlight for my colleagues an issue that I brought to the attention of the Rules Committee on a regular basis 
and that is breast cancer and the impact on African American female population. But overall, uh, breast cancer accounts for one in four diagnosis among women in this country. National Institutes of, of Health uh, is a major component in research for all diseases. Uh, and last week met with uh, one of the lead researchers at Baylor College of Medicine uh, and um, uh, emphasized uh, the major impact. Research is being stopped in its tracks right now uh, in our research institutions across America. In fact, uh, the doctor brought with him two researchers whose work may simply end because of these cuts. And so I ask my colleagues to consider Amendment Number 6, which is a sense of Congress that provides for ensuring uh, that no reduction should be made in funding that's available to the NIH. And I do cite uh, a overseas contingency fund that was cited in the Budget Committee uh, as a source. And I hope my colleagues will consider the importance uh, of uh, letting our research go forward. My second amendment, I'm joined uh, by Hank Johnson, and it has to do with the uh, issues of uh, crime. And it is an amendment simply that says that no reduction should be made in funding made available to the Department of Justice for crime prevention programs, which is an array of issues, particularly gun trafficking. Uh, who knows where we'll go with respect to the numbers of gun um, regulation, uh, we do know that seemingly the gun trafficking legislation is drawn by partisan support, but resources will be needed to implement that. Resources will be needed for the ATF. And as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, when we were discussing what we should do about uh, border security, I just made the point uh, that um, the border area and border patrol agents were getting more funding than FBI, ATF, and DEA combined. I don't want to shortchange the border. But I am saying that it's important that those crime-fighting elements not be reduced. Uh, so I ask my colleagues um, just to consider the policy points that I'm making uh, in these amendments, and I ask for them to be made in order. Uh, and again, um, let me conclude by saying uh, that if we look at our history books, we'll note that there was no budget in the 1700s and the 1800s, and really an actual budget process started, I believe, uh, in the 1920s. We were just fine without it. Uh, what our constituents are asking is, what are we doing in terms of coming together and providing the resources that they need to help them create jobs? They need jobs. Uh, and um, all of us are good friends. And I do not see the job creation element uh, in HRS 25. Mr. Chairman, I finish on this note. I don't see pending crisis around every block in every unopened door. This is a great country. And we have great genius here. And I'd like the Congress to stop speaking about doom and gloom and start talking about investments. Investment in the NIH, uh, investments in education, investments in infrastructure, and creating a base of jobs that will in actuality do better than what we've done. 7.7 percent .7 unemployment. Uh, somebody's unemployed, so they don't think that's great, but the numbers have come down. But if we can get our numbers down, as, as we have heard over and over again, that's the investment that churns the economy. This budget does not, and it hurts me to think that the NRH will be in the eye of the storm in terms of cuts, and it also hurts me to think that our crime fight fighting needs, no matter what your opinion is about certain new legislation, uh, would actually suffer uh, if we go forward with both HRES 25 and, of course, the sequester. So I thank my colleagues for listening and I ask that my amendments uh, be made in order. Uh, and uh, I do note that my amendment number seven uh, has an offset. Yep. Appreciate Thank you, you very much. Appreciate the gentleman uh, from Texas uh, being here. And I would uh, now look at the uh, gentlemen that are co-organizing uh, uh, their effort. And, and I, I, it's my understanding that Mr. Ellison, you would wish to be recognized first. The gentleman's recognized. I'm going to thank uh, our ranking member as well and all the members of the committee. Yeah, the work you do is really hard and takes a lot of patience and attention. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just want to point out to you just a few things about the Progressive Caucus budget, uh, the Progressive Caucus Substitute Amendment. 
uh, our budget is uh, entitled the back to work budget that's what we call it the back to work budget it focuses on America's number one priority which is job creation we bring unemployment down to 5.3 percent within three years by including robust investments in construction uh, public workers like teachers uh, cops uh, and uh, we also are fiscally responsible uh, we uh, reduce the deficit by 4.4 trillion by closing tax loopholes that benefit uh, the most fortunate and well-to-do in our community uh, and our budget achieves a deficit level of under 2 percent of GDP by 2016 uh, which is widely accepted as a sustainable level of, of uh, a sustainable level as I mentioned uh, we focus uh, on jobs and uh, we also uh, 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 focus on other key priorities of, of our country. Job-wise, I'll just be quick and just focus on that because I know my, my co-presenter has uh, some things to present, but we make substantial investments in infrastructure. Uh, according to the American Society of Civil Engineers, we have a significant gap between what our infrastructure maintenance budget should be and what it is, and we make that up, get better infrastructure, and in the meantime, put a lot of people back to work we also put funding into modernization of 35,000 public schools. I'm sure you know, Mr. Se uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, as everybody on the, uh, on the dais knows, we have crumbling school infrastructure around this nation. And also we help states re rehire uh, 300,000 teachers who have been laid off since 2008, as well as police officers, firefighters, and other public employees. We also boost consumer demand by reinstating the make, work, pay tax credit for three years and extend the emergency unemployment compensation. So, uh, Mr. Chair, um, we also make some substantial cuts, I mean substantial reforms to our tax system. Uh, we need to, we have a tax system that needs and is calling for a reform. Uh, we have a tax system that favors corporate special interests as well as uh, the most well-to-do. Uh, and, and so what we need is a greater degree of fairness and efficiency uh, income inequality in our country is getting worse over the last three decades. The income of the wealthiest 1 percent of America's rose 155 percent, while the bottom 80 percent saw their incomes rise by 41 percent. And our tax system exacerbates this inequality. And so uh, what we do uh, is we uh, make a number of uh, changes to raise the proper revenue by closing loopholes uh, on yachts and jets. We treat carried interest as regular income. We close uh, the loopholes available to the, uh, to the fossil fuel industry. Uh, and in so doing, we, we, we make up substantial uh, savings for, for our government. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Grijalva. That gentleman's recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and, uh, and the members and the ranking member. Thank you for the time. Uh, we feel our substitute amendment uh, should have its day in the sun, uh, as other amendments and, and other budgets will uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, we've, we've, we feel we've provided a pretty clear choice, and that in this debate about the budget, about deficits, about the grand bargain, uh, I think the American people and our colleagues in Congress uh, should, be a, should be able to make some choices. And our budget, as my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Ellison and friend said, uh, we make the distinction early on that the key to the revitalization of our economy, to sustainability of the economy, is people working. So the first three years of this budget is concentrated on pe putting people to work. We suspend the sequester for, for, and, and look at, at deficit reduction and look at balancing down the road after the three years in a very conscious effort to make an investment early and allow the revenue from this investment to drive us. 5.7 trillion in new revenue, uh, as, as Keith said, I get to a point in 2006 where we have a sustainable ratio in terms of deficit to GDP, and more importantly, if we're, we're not going to cut our way out of the problems that we have in this economy. 
And when, when 12% of our budget, discretionary uh, budget, is the source of 80 to 90% of the spending cuts, there is going to be serious impact on the American people. Uh, we already know from CBO of the loss of jobs, 650 to 700,000 the first year. And I think as we look at the budget for the future, uh, our, our effort as, as the Progressive Caucus is to invest early, not to be shy about that investment. Look at deficit not as something you ignore, but something that you plan for and begin the process of reduction and balance down the future. Uh, we're, we hope that uh, you'll consider this amendment. Uh, it is an amendment that, uh, with a great deal of work for many colleagues in this caucus, we're talking about a, fa about a fair tax system, fair corporate tax, investment, and key to that whole budget is the issue of putting Americans back to work. Uh, I think we do that, and all of us collectively, regardless of whatever our party affiliation might be or our ideo ideological point of view might be, putting Americans back to work is going to be the best elixir for this economy and continuing on a path like the Ryan budget to further decimate what we don't have in the infrastructure of this country is and create job loss is going to drive us in a whole different direction. Uh, I would suggest that our budget deserves a fair hearing, and I appreciate any consideration you can give, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. I, uh, my question is that the President of the United States stood before us the other day and spoke about the need to have uh, education to four-year-olds in, uh, in, I assume, our elementary schools. So I really am not tagging the president with not coming up the budget yet because I assume that's a big undertaking with his proposal to go and add up how much, you know, it would have, we'd have to rebuild schools and get that prepared. My question is, you talked about schools. Did you try and use the president's proposal and try and give some number for a fourth grade, a four-year-old education now to be included in uh, as the president sure. had spoken to us about? Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in our budget, as part of the reinvestment, uh, we talk about rehiring the 300,000 public education teachers that have that have left the system since 2008, and we talk about modernization and rehabilitation for 35,000 schools. Uh, we increase we increase base education funding so that American children are not fa falling behind, and I would suggest specifically that bringing back to reduce class size, allow different curricular planning, that the addition of 300,000 teachers over the period of those first three years uh, would, would satisfy pre-K and universal pre-K for, uh, for children in America. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Fox? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the... Um, our three colleagues for being here tonight, but I don't have any questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McGovern. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first I'd like to ask unanimous consent to uh, ask uh, that the testimony of uh, Representative Maxine Waters and Representative John Delaney uh, be made part of the record. They had amendments here that they wanted to. Without objection. Okay. Um, let me just say to my colleagues, I appreciate very much you being here uh, because I think this is precisely the discussion that we need to have, and that is how to put people back to work. As I said when Chairman Ryan was here, uh, deficit reduction in and of itself is not an economic policy. Um, there has to be other parts to this, uh, including investment. Um, and uh, one of the discussions that we haven't had here uh, is about what is the cost uh, to this country, for example, uh, when you start cutting the budgets of NIH. What does that mean in terms of prolonging the day that you find a cure to Alzheimer's disease, for example, which then in turn could result in improving human life, but also saving Medicaid a whole bunch of money. What is the cost? I mean, uh, Chairman Ryan's budget cuts uh, uh, snap or by $135 billion over 10 years. What happens to these people who, uh, who will lose, who have, a, who have a food benefit today and tomorrow will lose that food benefit? Did it just magically get jobs? Re reality is uh, millions of people on SNAP work. 
they work for a living, but the wages are so low, they still qualify for this assistance. But what happens to these people? You know, what, what, what is the impact by not investing in our infrastructure? I mean, and I think, uh, you know, that to me is, uh, is, is the missing part of, of our discussion on this budget here. Um, you know, it's not about who can balance the budget in one year, two years, three years, four years, or five years, or ten years. You know, it's about moving the budget, budget toward balance, getting our fiscal house in order. You know, if we get our, our, our economy back on strong footing sooner, we can end up collecting revenues to reduce our, our deficit, get rid of our deficit, you know, much, a lot quicker. That's what happened when Bill Clinton was president. You know, I mean, it was record job growth that was one of the biggest drivers to a deficit reduction. It wasn't taking a meat axe approach uh, to, to the budget or this senseless sequester um, approach, uh, mindless cuts, senseless cuts across the bo board where if you had a line at them entitled fraud, waste, and abuse, it would be treated the same way as monies for NIH. It doesn't make any sense to me. But, I mean, I, I guess I, 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 I'm curious to your reaction. I mean, if we don't make these investments, you know, in education um, in, in research, you know, we lose our innovative edge. Um, other countries are making these investments. Um, you know, we end, up, we, we, we end up having a debate solely about numbers, and we forget that there are real people behind those numbers. And I'd be curious to get your take I, on that. I would suggest, thank you, I would suggest that, that you know, I've heard other people, you know, that your budget is your, your roadmap, your moral document, and who you are as a, as a people or as a nation. I would suggest if there is, uh, if we're only talking about austerity, if we're only talking about how much can we save by cutting, that there's consequences. And maybe we're, only, we're, only, we're talking about unintended consequences, but they become reality very soon. And, and our budget, I hope you understand, is very honest. Well, I, I the first three years, we're spending, we're investing, with the consequence of reducing as we go down the road. Because uh, I'm convinced that if there's two things at stake here, we think our budget reflects the economic necessity and how to get us back to a stable economy, but I, I think it also reflects something about the social fiber of this nation. Because there are consequences, there are human beings, and the divisions and the splits that we see are gonna be aggravated because of economics, and they're going to be aggravated by cuts that affect certain groups of people, and so the tensions that we want to avoid as a nation, the fiber that we want to go, keep together is, is going to be further stressed if we don't make some serious investments and some very profound consideration, not just about the economics, but the social fiber of this country of ours. Mr. Burgess raised the, he referred to a public opinion poll um, in which he said that the uh, majority of people, when asked a question, would, would they like spending cut and their taxes reduced, said that they would like that. I don't know anybody who wouldn't, you know, who in, in theory doesn't, you know, that, that idea is not attractive. But it, it get, I, I bet you that, th that those numbers would change when you say uh, spending cut, but we're going to cut Medicare, or we're going to cut, you know, money for infrastructure, or we're going to cut money for National Institutes of Health, a National Science Foundation. Now, that's not saying that there aren't places that you can cut. I mean, I think what you, you know, with, 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 you know, a skilled surgeon and a scalpel, you can go through this government and find places where you can, where you, where you can cut. But, uh, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, um, you know, I think one of the things that makes, it, makes this country great is that we have had a tradition of not turning our backs on the most vulnerable, uh, and you know, I don't want to lose that tradition. Um, and uh, you, know, you know, I mentioned to Chairman Ryan before we came very close in the 1970s to ending hunger in, in this country. We have now gone in the exact opposite direction since then. We're now 50 million people um, who are food insecure or hungry. You know, and, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, there was a, a poll done. I, I'm not chairman yet. No, I was addressing um, Mr. Uh, Congressman Sessions. Mr. Chairman, there was a poll done with last year's progressive budget, the Balancing Act, and, and the poll said that if you didn't put an ideological or a party on it, um, that 47% of Republican voters thought that budget was a good budget. It was replacing the sequester. Re replacing the sequester, and, uh, which is better than it did within our own caucus, but that's another story. 
the point being that I think sometimes if we provide the American people with common sense and realistic choices, they're pretty smart. They're going to figure it out. Well, let me I just add yeah. something to it, if I might. Um, the Ryan budget does not stop, um, if I might say, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Slaughter, Mr. Ranking Member, and Mr. Governor, on your question. Um, the Ryan budget does nothing to stop the sequester. Under the sequester, HHS, I understand, gets a $3.7 billion cut. Put that on top of uh, the Ryan budget, and you stop job creation in its tracks as relates to the NIH receipt and research uh, that is so vital, uh, R&D, just like you've said. This creates jobs, and it saves lives. And we've never um, had our future directed by pulling back. Uh, it's always going forward, uh, if I might. And so uh, to have a budget that literally stops us in our tracks, and let me just be very frank, stops researchers who are in the lab right now as we speak, they will be stopped. Uh, so the CPC budget is the right direction in terms of its length of commitment of creating jobs, but a stopping of the kind of funding that the NIH needs is also one, stopping research to save lives, but it's also cutting jobs. Well, I'll just conclude by, by thanking you for bringing this uh, alternative uh, to, the, uh, to the committee because, I, you know, I, when I, people ask me all the time, why aren't you talking about jobs in Washington? Why, why aren't you talking about, you know, rebuilding our infrastructure so that we can be competitive uh, in this global economy? Why, why aren't you talking about the importance of medical research? Why aren't you talking about the, the, those, those necessary investments that will end up growing our economy so we can actually get the revenues to pay down the, the, the deficit. And I think that you, uh, you and the Congressional Black Caucus uh, have offered alternatives and, and, and Congressman Van Hollen as well that I think are, are worth supporting. I look forward to voting for it when it comes to the floor. But thank you for being here. Thanks for your work on this too. And, um, and again, I just w want to point out I'm not going to criticize Ronald Reagan for being 45 days late this president being only 42 days late I, and bringing a budget. It, uh, the only thing I'd say to you, reasons. it hadn't arrived yet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, and, um, I, and I was most sincere about saying what I said. I do know the president brought the issue up, and I wanted to ask the question when he brought about schools, whether that was dovetailed in. Yep. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to do that up here. I was asking, I'm entitled to a question, and I do appreciate you. Uh, is there, are there further questions uh, up and down our aisle? Uh, gentleman, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, uh, just a couple of questions for my colleague from Texas on the uh, amendment that you've, the two amendments that you've brought. On the one where you have an offset, I think it's Amendment 7. Do we have an idea, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, do we have an idea as to how much how many, what, are, what is the dollar amount of that offset that you have brought with your amendment? It's a uh, policy statement that the NRH um, has um, monies shortchanged that could be compensated by the contingency fund. Let, let, me, let me clarify. This is Amendment 7 where you've brought a, an offset for the Department of Justice funding. Uh, the estate, yeah. Uh, to, to restoring the tax rates of the estate gift the generation tax. Right. And all of that was part of a bill that was passed by the House of Representatives in December of 2010. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was Speaker. I, I voted against that because I, I actually, this was one of the things that I didn't understand. But my understanding of this particular tax policy is that those those monies actually occurred that tax year, 2010. Uh, if I recall correctly, there were tax lawyers all over the country that had to cut their Christmas vacations short so they could come home and recalculate for their clients, their wealthy clients, about this generation skipping tax. And it was a huge windfall for them. But this was, uh, this was not something that was, uh, was, was passed by the Republican House or, or Paul Ryan. This was passed by, uh, by Speaker Pelosi when she was when she was Speaker, I don't have an idea as to what the number is. I'll be interested to know because that is an interesting offset that you've provided for us. But I think the time to capture that actually has has passed. I don't know that that's an that's an ongoing uh, savings that we could that we could capture. Just on the issue of the NIH, and now this is important to me because I do 
I care about the NIH as an institution. When the sequester uh, was signed by the president in our committee, we had hearings. We had the budget guy from HHS, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, came in and talked to us. I could not get any information out of him about how he prepare, proposed to prepare for these budget cuts that were coming to NIH. Uh, at that time, they were estimated between, between 7 to 8 percent across the board at HHS. Sure, I'd have rather seen those cuts be taken out of the CMS administrative budget. There's no reason to take them directly from research, uh, the research numbers. But I would also just offer, I mean, reading your amendment, it does sound like there will not be research done on triple negative breast cancer, and, and you know that's just not true. Because in your district, uh, MD Anderson Hospital, which is either in your district or not very far away, uh, Dr. DePino has started this moonshot cancer project where one of the features of his research is the triple negative breast cancer. And I realize there's some collaboration between NIH and their extramural program and, and institutions in Texas, and I'm very grateful for that. But at the same time, to give the impression that this research just stops dead in its tracks is, I mean, that's not fair. It is going to continue. MD Anderson is going to be in the vanguard of that. Some of those monies are they're coming are state monies that the state uh, actually put forward in its own cancer program. So uh, please don't give the impression to, to people who are watching this, and I know the nation is riveted on this discussion, but don't give the impression to the people who are watching this that uh, they, they, they're, they're going to lose all hope in the research arena. I will tell you, I was very frustrated when, when the stimulus bill passed. We were in the minority. There wasn't much I could do about it. NIH received $10 billion overnight. Um, do we know what the return on equity was for that $10 billion? I, I don't. I was never able to get a hearing in our Committee on Energy and Commerce. Uh, chairman Waxman then, who was chairman of the committee, did, uh, would not call one so that we could get an idea. I mean, I think the world of Dr. Collins, Dr. Francis Collins at NIH, but do we know the, the good deliverables that were achieved with that $10 billion? Do we know that the FDA was set up to handle the influx of new material that was going to be coming down the pipeline? I mean, here we sit four years later at the other end of that, and, and I don't know that we've got a lot to show for that effort. So the poor NIH, they've had to go from stimulus to sequester. We make their jobs harder, and I understand that, and I understand what you're trying to do with this amendment, but I, I think it's important to remember that some of the problems that are visited upon the NIH have been visited by both parties. It's not just a, a one-sided a one affair. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. The gentlelady lady's free to respond. I'd be delighted. I know, Dr. Burgess, you have a, a, an enormous uh, interest in health care, obviously, and I appreciate um, your commentary. If I can clarify <coughs> on both of the amendments. First, with the NIH, I'm quite well aware of what MD Anderson is doing because uh, I've had early discussions advocating for that decision that was made, and I'm delighted that it was made. But the research at MD Anderson is not uh, the research in the entire country. Um, MD Anderson is a singular, uh, major cancer research institution, among others, uh, that are also uh, in, involved in uh, a vast amount of cancer research. So the point of my amendment is to suggest that with the sequester already causing a $3.7 billion cut uh, in uh, HHS uh, and uh, no response in the Ryan budget, that this particular amendment is accurate in that it is suggesting that the impact in research across the country there should be a concern uh, that that research uh, not be reduced. I utilized that particular research, but it stands alongside of many other types of research. So um, there is no evidence that NIH will go unharmed. Uh, and I think the other point uh, that, that I would uh, like to make uh, is that I join you. Uh, it may be a difficult ask. Uh, to be able to, one, find out the impact of the stimulus dollars, but then also to be able to determine what the precise numbers are. We do know the cut is going to be um, a rather sizable cut because researchers are reaching out to Congress and Congress members uh, across the nation. On the uh, issue dealing with the Department of Justice and crime reduction, uh, this uh, amendment was to make the point about the need for revenue enhancement, and that is the reference to the 2009 
estate tax uh, for revenue enhancers. Um, I know the point that you made about whether it was a lawyer's windfall or not, it is to indicate, uh, and there's disagreement about that, uh, that those estate tax numbers are credible estate tax numbers and covers at least 90 plus percent of the Americans who have assets to be protected. And that crime reduction is something important and should be bipartisan. And that's the purpose of that amendment by myself and Mr. Johnson. But you cannot say that because of the fortunes of MD Anderson with pipeline research or pipeline dollars, um, and certainly they need more. I'm one of their strongest advocates that NIH overall will not have an impact and that research on this issue is only housed at MD Anderson. It is not. And therefore research research my time. And, and, and research in other places can't be accounted for. That's the purpose of the amendment. But I'm well aware of the research at MD Anderson. Re I was very much like in the midst of the discussion on that. And I thank Dr. Pacino for that. All the time. I, I will stipulate that both the gentleman and I likely voted against that, uh, that bill in, in 2010. But on the issue of the research at, at, at NIH, again, I asked their main budget guy to come in and talk to us in the spring of 2012 about what their plans were. This is, don't confuse this with the Ryan budget. This was an internal HHS budget person who was there talking to our committee that day. And they would not make the, the decision. They would not open the discussion to this. In fact, I was referred to the president's budget where the president said he was going to cut $200 million. But honestly, we were talking about an 8% cut at HHS. That's much more than $200 million. And this was far in advance of the, of the currently proposed Ryan budget. These dollars are important. I do agree with the gentlelady about that. But look, there was a way that these could have been apportioned within HHS in the spring of 2012. They chose not to do it. That's the reason the sequester went into effect, and that's the reason they were applied across the board. Thank the chairman. I'll yield back my time. If I may just say one sentence, Mr. Chairman. Then, Dr. Burgesson, we should try and fix the very problem that you are highlighting in terms of helping NIH. I thank the chairman. Uh, thank you. Back. Gentle, gentlewoman and the gentleman, is there further questions from this side? You, gentleman's recognized. Dr. Burgess, um, we made light of uh, when Mr. Van Hollen was here and he cited to an article uh, that appeared in the Washington Post. He didn't talk about the neutral or uh, determination that the article cites to. But then Dr. Burgess brought up the Hill uh, poll, and I have in hand um, uh, this uh, Monday, March 18th, uh, uh, version of the Hill, and I just want to have him make sure that he puts everything in context. The Hill poll says, voters prefer GOP budget policy, but party's brand is toxic to many. It also says, in its byline, voters prefer GOP ideas on budget, but dislike the Republican Party. I only offer that for the reason that this poll was done by something called Pulse Opinion Research. And what happens in newspapers, and all of us need to be very, very careful, in, uh, especially with the social media or uh, the way it is today, this will be all over the blogs of uh, uh, this particular uh, uh, statement. And the people that are against Republicans will pick up on what I just pointed out, and the people that are for them will pick up on the uh, lead portion of the sentence. And uh, I don't know Paul's opinion, but I know about Pulse's, uh, and I do know this, that uh, it's a lightweight um, uh, poll. It was a 1,000 people involved, and I don't know a 1,000 people in America that can give us a consensus on uh, virtually anything. We've lost our way here, people. And we had better get busy, uh, otherwise all of us aren't deserving of uh, the titles that we hold uh, when we find ourselves, as Mr. McGovern said earlier, so much further apart after the last election than we were before the election. And uh, it's incredible um, uh, to sit here um, and uh, listen uh, to the back and forth without us uh, really going into rooms together and coming to uh, consensus on what we can do about serious problems that all of us know that exist. I support very much um, uh, the progressive budget, 
and I ask all and believe that they will be made in order as has been custom, and I know this chairman is inclined in that uh, direction. I also ask all that Ms. Uh, Jackson Lee's uh, budget uh, um, amendments uh, uh, be made in order, and I would ask her to take particular cognizance while I'm an advocate, as is she and almost everybody on this committee, of uh, research being done um, uh, for breast cancer. Um, it is true that more men die of prostate cancer than women do of breast cancer. And prostate cancer needs to be taken into consideration in the research that's ongoing in that regard. In addition to that, more recent um, uh, pronouncements with reference to ovarian uh, cancer um, uh, rise high to the list of mortality uh, among women that uh, suffer that. We just can't... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once we start down this path, of not determining the priorities and personalizing those priorities based on parochial interests, then we aren't doing our jobs, people. And what we're going to do when, when we ultimately get around to it, I saw another article about senators trying to protect their states from the sequester. And we all tend to do that. This is an American problem. It's not a Fort Lauderdale problem or any one of us. And until such time as we come to some serious conclusions, uh, what we're going to do is keep going around and around and kicking the poor can until the poor can doesn't have any space to be kicked. And we need to be ashamed of ourselves uh, sitting up here, not in the Rules Committee. We do our job. As a matter of fact, everybody else goes home. Boston and Miami are playing and we're sitting around here bumping our gums about something that ain't going to happen uh, when all is finished anyhow. We need to get serious, and we are not serious, in my judgment, when we conti continue the ideological bents and relying on little bitty uh, polls. I've never had a poll in my whole political life, and I won all uh, my elections without polls, largely for the reason that I try to convince people to go to the polls and vote rather than try to find out which way the wind is blowing. And somehow or another, uh, we will be haunted, all of us, uh, by our failure to act on serious problems uh, having to do with the overall aspect of our society and not just one-sided uh, portions, which I can make the argument as good as anybody from a partisan point of view. Thank you. Gentlemen, yes, Yosef Times, uh, anyone seek further uh, requests for time? <laughs> I, 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 I see no further request from this side. Yes, sir. Ms. Post, do you wish to be recognized? Uh, I Mr. see Chairman, no further request from the committee. Mr. Chairman, could I just make one sentence to Mr. Hastings, how right he is on the impact of prostate, cervical, and all aspects of Cancer, which is the very premise of my amendment in terms of not cutting the NIH overall, and I thank you for that comment. I, yield I, want, to, I want to thank the uh, three uh, members who have taken their time to be here this evening. Uh, they're excused, and I want to thank them very much. The uh, gentleman, Mr. Woodall, uh, has chosen, although he represents a, uh, a, a bill that he would wish for the committee to consider, uh, as a result of time, he has uh, not subjected us to uh, that discussion at this time. Uh, seeing no further, seeing no further uh, witnesses, the uh, hearings closed on H. Conrad's 25, and the uh, chair now opens up uh, the hearing for H. Res 115, providing the express expenses of certain committees of the House of Representatives in the 113th Congress. And uh, the gentleman would uh, defer first to Mr. Nugent. Well, this is the, the gentleman is well, recognized. The, the it, it, last man standing. The, uh, I want to uh, apologize that the uh, chairwoman and uh, the ranking member could not be here uh, for this markup and for this uh, this hearing. The um, everybody knows reference Quester that all the committees uh, had to take cuts. Um, the aggregate was 11%. Some were. 
uh, slightly lower, some were slightly higher than that. And uh, we had two days of hearings, and then we had the final markup. Uh, it passed by voice vote. I do have the chairwoman's statement I'd like to enter into the record. That objection, uh, Chairwoman Miller's uh, statement be entered into the record. And so I think that uh, we're going to leave it at that. Short and sweet. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McGovern. Mr. Chairman, I, Ranking Member Brady, as was mentioned, was not able to attend today's meeting, but we want to make sure his opposition to the resolution is part of the record. And I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record the dissenting <coughs> views of Ranking Member Brady. Without objection, I'll be entered into the record. Uh, uh, Chairwoman Slaughter and I had an opportunity a week or so ago to up here before the uh, House Administration Committee, the gentleman, Mr. Nugent, who sits on the Rules Committee, was there. I believe we had a, an opportunity, notwithstanding that Ms. Slaughter gave a great testimony on behalf of not just the needs of the committee, but the needs of, in particular, uh, her side. Uh, and I believe that we were heard. I think that we recognized the, the uh, diminished ability of the committee. I think between yourself and uh, Mrs. Slaughter, you were able to convince the committee to uh, not cut you as much as others. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll accept that as the uh, statement from the committee. But, but we do want to also recognize, Mr. Nugent, that you serve due time on that committee, and we appreciate, we appreciate that. Uh, does anyone have a question? Mr. Chairman, I don't have a Jones question. Right just now. comment. Pennywise and pound foolish. We continue to believe that we are going to be able to, after the cat is out of the wallop, or uh, put it back in at some point in time. Having these fine young people that are here, every last one of them, two or three years from now, is going to be looking for another job because they ain't going to be making the kind of money that they need to make and they rightly earn. And it's silly for us to go down this path. I'll stand up and defend what the Rules Committee and every other committee and every other staffer uh, that we wind up having to cut. Here we are with technology exploding all around us and people expecting and demanding more and more of us as constituents as is their right and responsibility, and we're going to go in the opposite direction. Double that with uh, uh, the edicts of uh, Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner with reference to travel. Here the world is globalizing, and where we are is in a position where we aren't going to, we, we, we can't even go to Afghanistan or Iraq on a military jet. That's crazy. And we can't keep going down this path. I will vote against this particular measure, not because of the Rules Committee, but because it's penny wise and pound foolish. Appreciate the. Uh Feedback from the gentleman is there further. Mr. Chairman, I Ms. Woodall's recognized. Can I just get a clarification? I thought I understood Mr. Nugent to say this resolution passed in committee by a voice vote, but I thought I understood Mr. McGovern to say he has a statement from the ranking member in opposition to the resolution. Uh, General Yield, yeah, I do have a statement in opposition that I that I presented, and um, and since you yield, I'm going to associate myself with Mr. Hastings' remarks. I thought he was right on target. That is correct. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further discussion for our witness. Uh, I want to thank the gentleman for appearing for the committee, and that gentleman is now excused. The uh, hearing portion uh, of HRS 115 is now uh, closed, and the uh, gentleman will be in receipt of a motion from the gentlewoman from uh, Dr. Fox from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee grant H. Conrad 25, establishing the budget. For the United States government for fiscal year 2014 and setting forth appropriate budgetary levels for fiscal years 2015 through 2023, a structured rule. The rule provides four hours of general debate with three hours confined to the congressional budget, equally dividing control by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on the Budget, and one hour on the subject of economic goals and policies, equally dividing control by Representative Brady of Texas and Representative Carolyn Maloney of New York or their designees. The rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the concurrent resolution and provides that it shall be considered as read. The rule makes in order only those amendments printed in the Rules Committee report. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable 
for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent and shall not be subject to amendment. The rule waives all points of order against the amendments printed in the report except that the adoption of an amendment in the nature of substitute shall constitute the conclusion of consideration of the concurrent resolution for amendment. The rule provides upon the conclusion of consideration of the concurrent resolution for amendment for final period of general debate which shall not exceed 10 minutes equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the budget. The rule permits the chair of the budget committee to offer amendments in the House pursuant to section 305A5 of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974 to achieve mathematical consistency. The rule provides that the concurrent resolution shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question of its adoption. Section 2 of the rule provides that on any legislative day during the period from March 22, 2013 through April 8, 2013, A, the journal of the proceedings of the previous day shall be considered as approved. The chair may at any time declare the House adjourned to meet at a date and time within limits of Clause 4, Section 5, Article 1 of the Constitution to be announced by the chair in declaring the adjournment and C, bills and resolutions introduced during the period addressed by this section shall be numbered, listed in the congressional record, and when printed shall bear the date of introduction, but may re be referred by the speaker at a later time. Section 3 of the rule provides that the speaker may appoint members to perform the duties of cha chair for the duration of the period addressed by Section 2 of the res resolution as though under Clause 8A of Rule 1. Section 4 of the rule provides that each day during the period addressed by Section 2 of the resolution shall not constitute a calendar day for purposes of Section 7 of the War Powers Resolution. Finally, Section 5 of the rule provides for consideration of HRES 115, providing for the expenses of certain committees of the House of Representatives and 113th Congress under a closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on House Administration. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the resolution and provides that it shall be considered as read. The rule provides one motion to recommit without instructions. You've heard the motion of the gentlewoman from North Carolina, and I would defer to the gentleman, uh, Mr. Woodall, for further explanation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, having gone through 12 hours of budget uh, uh, hearings so far uh, this year, uh, I'm glad we uh, are proposing a rule that allows every substitute uh, that anyone invested in time and energy into creating uh, as uh, uh, being in order as part of the debate uh, on the floor. I'm also glad we're moving forward with the committee uh, funding uh, resolution. The cuts are not easy uh, cuts, but implementing them earlier uh, is going to let folks uh, budget better at a committee level than, than doing them later. Uh, and I'm also glad that uh, in the context of that uh, uh, budget uh, committee debate uh, that we're going to give Mr. Van Hollen and Mr. Ryan a chance at the end of that debate to, to wrap things up after what will, I'm sure, have been a, a lively uh, discussion of those five, uh, five alternatives. I thank the uh, gentleman. You've now heard the motion, gentlewoman from North Carolina, and explanation of that. Uh, are, there, are there any amendments? Yes, Mr. Uh, gentleman, sorry. Sure, I have an amendment to the rule. I move the committee make an order and give the necessary waivers for the following amendments. Delaney, number 11, Jackson Lee, number 6, and number 7, and Waters, number 8. You uh, now have heard the uh, amendment uh, from uh, the gentleman from uh, Massachusetts. The uh, chair would uh, offer an explanation that he would Encourage a no vote. Uh, these are uh, members who have taken time to, many of them to come up here, have taken time to do the due diligence and the budget activity. However, we're trying to draw upon uh, what we believe is not only precedent but the right thing to do to make in order uh, those substitutes that would uh, be more full in their scope and nature, and thus I would offer a uh, no vote. All those in favor of the my government amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no? No. Uh, the uh, no's have it. Are there further amendments or discussion? Uh, seeing none, uh, we've now moved the uh, uh, agreement for the motion. Gentlewoman from uh, North Carolina, those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, please be advised that Mr. Woodall will be the uh, manager and for the Republicans. Ms. Slaughter. And Ms. Slaughter. I've also been advised that the next meeting we're uh, waiting now Senate action on the uh, continuing resolution 
and we believe that uh, cloture has been achieved and that the Senate is moving forward. I talked to the gentlewoman about earlier in the evening about how we might approach this, and it was left out of the rule. We believe that the uh, Senate will move forward and that we will receive it promptly, and uh, we'll wait for that action. So pending that, uh, the uh, committee will be adjourned. <laughs>